And in that capacity, I am the director of the Boston Art Commission, and I am very happy to be able to welcome you all here today. Um, you are joining us for the second of two special meetings of the Boston Art Commission on the Emancipation Group, a copy of a statue in Washington, D.C. by Thomas Ball. And I'd like to start by just thanking everyone again for being here tonight. With the abundance of public interest that we have received by email and petition, and a desire to be responsive, we held the first of our special meetings last Thursday, June 25th. We thank any of you who were in attendance last week, and especially those who gave such thoughtful and moving testimony. For those of you who are not able to attend, you can find a recording of the meeting on our website at boston.gov slash art under review. And we'll send that out to you by chat. Thank you. Uh, as background, the Boston Art Commission, uh, staffed by the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, is an independent board composed of nine, currently eight appointed art and design professionals that holds public meetings to review and vote on matters concerning the city's art collection. Meetings are generally held on the second Tuesday of each month to review current public art projects cited on or proposed for City of Boston property. In accordance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are conducting this meeting virtually. To ensure public access to the deliberations of the Boston Art Commission, the public may access this meeting through telephone and video conferencing. And this will also be posted on our website after today. The city of Boston through meetings held by the Boston Art Commission is assessing the historical and cultural significance of our collection and the harm done to people through racist imagery and symbolism. We are committed to taking the necessary steps to ensure that our public art collection enhances our city and will engage in community conversations to determine the future of specific works. The conversations that come out of a public dialogue will help guide decisions around our art collection. They may also help us better understand our histories and envision our future. We encourage you to share your recommendations on the future of the Emancipation Group by offering verbal testimony today, which we'll instruct you on shortly, and we'll be allowing two minutes per person for verbal testimony. I'm joined by my colleagues from the Mayor's Office of Art and Culture in facilitating this meeting, Christina Carroll, Director of Communications, Patricia Gilrain, Collections Manager, and Sarah Rodrigo, Public Art Manager, and they will be managing the slides, monitoring the chat, as well as raised hands. I'll now hand it over to Chair Mark Pasnick and Vice Chair Aqua Holmes. They will call the meeting to order and go over some further instruction. Thank you, Karen, and welcome to everybody. Uh, we're pleased to have you here. Um, I'm calling to order this special meeting uh, of the Boston Public Art Commission at 5.06 p.m. Um, I will be co-chairing this with uh, Vice Chair Aqua Holmes. Uh, we'll share the duties associated with all aspects of the meeting. Um, I'd like to now take a roll call. These are the commissioners um, uh, in order uh, to ensure that we have a quorum. After I state your name, commissioners, please say here. Um, Aqua Holmes. Aqua, you're maybe mu muted. Here, and welcome everyone. Thank you, Aqua. Uh, Camilo Alvarez. Here. Uh, Michael Canizzo. Here. Cara Elliott Ortega. Here. George Fifield. Here. Robert Friedman. Here. And Lisa Tung. Here. Uh, a quorum has been met. Uh, next slide, please. We will be following the publicly posted agenda, uh, which will now appear on your screen. Um, you'll see the agenda here. Uh, we will begin with the director's report and then have public testimony on the Emancipation Group, a copy of the sculpture in Washington, D.C. by Thomas Ball. Uh, Karen, uh, would you like to? Yes, thank you. The purpose of my report today will be to discuss the Boston Art Commission's intent to follow a public process in regards to the Emancipation Group and provide background on the sculpture itself, the public process to the state, and ways uh, to engage in the, in the meeting today and moving forward. The Emancipation Group was installed in Park Square in 1879. The sculpture is by Thomas Ball, but it is a copy of an original artwork that is currently in Washington, D.C. 
inscriptions on this statue read, a race set free and the country at peace, Lincoln rest from his labors, as well as given to the city of Boston by Moses Kimball, 1879. The Emancipation Group has been criticized since its installation, primarily for its visual representation of Archer Alexander as the passive recipient of Lincoln's gift of freedom. Many also feel that it inaccurately implies that one person is solely responsible for ending slavery, representing, uh, presenting Lincoln as a paternalistic white savior and obscuring his complex history. The BAC has received repeated calls for its removal, including a recent petition that has garnered many thousands of signatures. So memorials are long known to be symbols, at least many in this country, that promote white supremacy. They're being challenged and removed around the world in response to, to the demands of protesters calling for anti-racism policies and decolonization. The City of Boston and the Boston Art Commission, which is responsible for the commissioning, acquisition, and maintenance of the art collection owned by the City of Boston, recognize the significant yet often overlooked role public art plays in this city and the need for the collection to reflect our residents and the values of our communities. Unfortunately, and despite ongoing efforts, African Americans, women, indigenous peoples, local activists, LGBTQIA plus figures, and many others are missing from the commemorative landscape in our public spaces and have been missing for centuries. Addressing the failures and voids in the city's commemorative landscape is in line with the goals and visions articulated in the BAC's curatorial mission, which you see above, in particular, and the aims of engaging communities, enriching and enlivening the urban environment and enhancing diversity. Examining and interpreting the city's public art collection and addressing inequities that are embedded in some of our monuments and memorials are also directly in line with the city's cultural plan, Boston Creates, and the city's resilient Boston plan for racial equity. As we work to address racism as a public health crisis in the city, it's important to evaluate the role and impact of our collection. A truly comprehensive approach to the consideration of problematic artworks will address their complex histories and origins and allow for members of the public to contribute their own observations and suggestions of monuments that need recontextualization additional educational components, or require removal. In 2017, the BAC established a collection policy to ensure that only artworks of the highest quality and enduring value are accepted into and kept in the city's holdings. With the creation of that policy, the Art Commission also established a process to formally remove artworks. The Art Commission may also consider commissioning responsive works from artists or partnering with educators and cultural organizers to provide public interpretation, events, and learning opportunities. In 2018, the Boston Arts Commission commissioned an Opportunity for Change, a report on the national dialogue surrounding monuments and its relevance to Boston's public art collection. This report was revisited at the June 9, 2020 public meeting of the BAC. In 2019, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Cultures began an effort to catalog the city's art collection and create a searchable data database, online database, with educational content. By evaluating and understanding the artworks in the city's collection, we can understand what stories and people are missing, which artworks need to be reinterpreted or re-examined, and where the biases and prejudices have been embedded in artistic choices. As part of this process, we have sought input in assessing our monuments and memorials. Uh, you can see here some means of public dialogue that we've been uh, receiving and organizing, including uh, what we're doing here today, uh, the two special meetings of the Boston Art Commission to hear public testimony. We have received 168 letters, um, or 166, that letter, that number has been changing. Um, letters emailed to us as written testimony. And we have also received 645 responses to our online survey. And the last we checked, the petition um, by Tori Bullock had received 12,639 signatures. The BAC conducted uh, the survey I just mentioned to provide the public with background on the artwork and also to garner feedback. In the survey, we, we listed out a number of different options um, for possible actions and considerations. 
including providing additional educational information at the current site to inform the public about the Emancipation Proclamation, ongoing calls for justice, the failures of reconstruction, and the deficiencies of the artwork. Another option was to commission a new work of art, permanent or temporary, to be in dialogue with the existing Emancipation Group, creating a learning opportunity about both the statute's subject matter and current calls for justice. Third was to partner with educational organizations to provide events and learning opportunities around the controversial issues the statue raises and the role of visual language in perpetuating harmful prejudices. We asked people if they were interested in relocating the statue to a new site, such as a museum, if available, where viewers can be provided with appropriate information about the statue's theme of emancipation, as well as the biases and prejudices that are embedded in artistic choices. Another option was to remove the statue entirely from public view and to formally remove, to deaccession it from the city's collection. The last option we, we provided was to commission a new work of art, permanent or temporary, that replaces the existing statue. And we had a, a category other as well that people were able to check off. And here you can see um, the responses to that to the question for people to select any and all of the recommendations that they thought might be appropriate. Um, we received, as I mentioned, a total of 645 responses. Um, and looking at zip codes, which we asked for, we believe that 377 of them were from Boston. Um, and this is the breakdown of the total responses. The top three choices uh, can be seen here. The first choice is in orange, 384 in terms of all that were received or to commission a new work of art, permanent or temporary, that replaces the existing statue. The second received 271, and that was to relocate the statue to a new site, such as a museum, uh, where viewers can be provided with appropriate information. And the third choice was to remove the statue entirely from public view and formally remove it from the city's collection. And next you can see um, if we looked at only the Boston recipients, uh, respondents, you can see it was more or less the same, although the second and third place shifted. Um, the top choices were, again, to commission a new work of art to replace the existing piece. And the second was to remove the statue from public view and to formally remove it from our collection. And the third choice was to remove the, the statue and relocate it to a, a new site, such as a museum, where viewers can be provided with information. Next, we asked people to rank these options. So um, in this one, we, they looked at all seven different options, uh, including other, and they ranked which ones were most important to them. And so here we've highlighted for all the respondents we got, the 645, the first, second, and third. Um, the commission, a new artwork was selected by the majority as the most important for the city. Uh, you can see that again, um, anything that was number one is shown in orange there um, with uh, 225 for commissioning a new piece in, re in replacing the existing one and providing additional context. Um, oh, second was um, simply removing it and decommissioning it and deaccessioning it and third was providing additional context. And if you go to the next one, this chart shows the options ranking for respondents who identified as Boston residents. Again, commissioning a new work was the first choice for the majority of respondents, but simply removing the statue identified as the second most important choice and providing additional context as a distant third, the 58 first choice selections. We mentioned that we have been receiving um, written testimony. We are continuing to get those in. Um, they have been shared with the Art Commission. Um, we have received, uh, the count seems to be 166. And the emails represent a wide array of opinions and experiences with the Emancipation Group. We have a very generalized breakdown here of the 166. Um, you can see here that 121 were in favor of removal, 39 in favor of the statue remaining with others having sort of um, uncertainty about what the next step should be. Um, the letters and their large quantity reflected the passion and thoughtfulness that this statue inspires, as well as the pain felt by many Bostonians about the representation it represents of Black Bostonians in our public space, Black Americans in our public space. Overall, the breakdown of responses suggests that citizens favor the removal of the statue and its replacement with a work of monumental art designed by a Black local artist. 
The vast majority of responses, however, including those for and against removal, agree that this statue represents an important moment in American and Boston history and hope to find a solution that does not erase the emancipation group from history, but moves, contextualizes, or amends it to better reflect both the history and the present day reality of racism in the United States against Black Americans, as well as the incredible success of Black Americans against these odds. As was noted earlier in this meeting, examination of the Emancipation Group and other artworks in the city's collection has been ongoing, an ongoing conversation for many years. In 2018, the Boston Art Commission commissioned a report on Boston's commemorative landscape, specifically objects in the city's public art collection that are or could be deemed controversial. The report is entitled An Opportunity for Change, Discussing Monuments in Boston and Beyond by Eva Matsicek, and it was written um, over the summer of 2018. And the report, uh, which is posted on our website, if you do want to read it, it has two parts. Uh, the first being an overview of the current debate about monuments across the US and an assessment of how other cities have responded. The second part examines monuments in Boston that are some way controversial, offer opportunities to engage with problematic histories and makes connections between the Boston Art Commission's curatorial mission and this national debate about commemorative public art. The report was intended to provide a concise summary of the current debate about monuments in the US, including an overview of how other cities have dealt with this issue, as many were at the time of its commissioning, to examine Boston's commemorative landscape, to provide a summary of the objects that are or may become controversial, and to begin a conversation about how to address these issues. Recommendations included small adjustments, like changing language found in the online database, proposing additional information, interpretive material on site, and imagining alternative interventions. And here the, you can see the six local monuments that were, um, were named in the report. The first being Christopher Columbus in Christopher Columbus Park in the North End. The second, the Boston Common Tablet, the Blackstone Tablet on the Common. The third being the Emancipation Group in Park Square. Uh, fourth was the Founders Memorial uh, on the Boston Common. Uh, fifth was Samuel Elliott Morrison on the Comab Mall. And lastly, we had the Francis Parkman Memorial um, in Jamaica Plain. Additionally, the conclusion of the report states, the six Boston monuments examined were by, are by no means a complete catalog of objects that beg closer critical attention. For example, next on the list are John Endicott Monument and the Irish Famine Commemoration, both of which have drawn criticism during their time as part of the city's commemorative landscape. Indeed, a truly comprehensive approach would allow for members of the public to contribute their own observations and suggestions of monuments that need recontextualization, spark interest, or may even someday require removal. The conversations that come out of a public dialogue can only strengthen the city's efforts to make progress on racial equity and create an ecosystem that supports and celebrates art and culture for all Bostonians. Finally, the report makes the following suggestions for the Emancipation Group. The statue should be removed and relocated. Options for relocation are long-term loan with the MFA or other institution, place somewhere where it can be in conversation with other representations from the historical era and can be interpreted by educators. Community dialogue should be encouraged about the statue through online or other platforms. This removal and potential relocation option should be an important step in demonstrating the city's commitment to, and to listening to and valuing black voices as well as commitment to racial equity. If the statue cannot be removed, at the very least, the city needs to add interpretive material to the site and develop materials around harmful visual representation, including the statue for educational purposes. Context should also be added by commissioning contemporary artists for temporary or permanent works at the site. Uh, now we will move on to the public testimony, beginning with information on how you may participate. Karen will give you some instructions on the way you can participate using the Zoom platform. Uh, so we are so glad you're here today to share testimony and I'll just give you a little bit of an instruction. You can uh, request time to testify in a few different ways. By Zoom, you can use the raise your hand function uh, and you can also let us know you want to speak by entering a request in the chat box. By phone, if you are calling in, you can press star nine to let us know you wish to speak. Staff will put you in a digital line and when it's your turn, we'll announce your name and you should unmute yourself. And please at all other times do keep yourself muted. 
when it is your turn, please share your name with us and your testimony and keep your testimony to two minutes so we have time for everyone to speak. If you're not familiar with Zoom, here are some of the icons you should be looking for. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you might see um, the, the chat button and that's where you can enter and just let us know you'd like to speak. You can also press on the participants button. And once you hit that, you'll see this second bar um, and you can hit that blue hand to let us know you'd like to speak. And again, when you're called on, please unmute yourself um, and announce your name and keep to your two minutes, please. Uh, so we're leaving this information up so you can follow it. Please uh, follow these instructions if you'd like to sign up now uh, and put your name on the list of speakers. We'll be having a list um, that we will call names out. Vice Chair Holmes and I will be inviting you to give your testimony in the sequence of names that will appear on the screen. While we understand that many of you may have a lot to say and have deep passions about this, uh, in order to hear from as many voices as possible, we will ask you to keep your testimony to two minutes uh, and given that we have almost 200 people on the uh, call, we'll, we'll be, um, uh, we'll be uh, interrupting you if you go much beyond that. Thanks, Mark. Um, while the staff gets the list organized and you <clears throat> get in the queue for speaking, I'd like to just make a short statement as Vice Chair of the Boston Art Commission. Um, we have been so inspired by these conversations letters and responses to surveys, the videos, blog posts, social media comments, and editorials that have offered ideas about how to proceed with the Emancipation Group. I actually took a trip down there today to look at it one last time before this meeting. Um, and there were several people there taking pictures. So this is definitely in the public consciousness. These comments have come from our neighbors and fellow Bostonians, as well as people previously unknown to us and outside of our city. They've been characterized though by insight, thoughtfulness, and passion. In addition, we want to acknowledge the 12,000 plus uh, signatures organized by Tori Bullock, an artist in the Boston area, and the 600 plus respondents to the Art Commission survey, and also the speakers at last Thursday night's hearing. Together they remind us of the scale of impact of our process and what can happen when we work together. Uh, we also want to recognize the tireless contributions of the Boston Art Commission staff who have been dedicated to helping the commission take on the issue of social justice uh, in our community and our collection, guiding us since 2018 with the report that Karen spoke of, which set the course for this very meeting tonight. All the members of the commission realize the gravity of the issues we are examining today, and we look forward to being guided by your testimony in this session, as we have been by many hundreds of others over the last week. We are here to listen. With that, uh, Vice Chair Holmes will call our first speaker. Okay, I'd like to invite Rochelle Brown to speak. Rochelle, are you with us? I am, Awesome, great to have you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, I am Rochelle Brown and I am a member of the Veterans and Friends of Edward O. Gordine Veterans Memorial Park. Uh, the park was created at the initiative of my father, Ralph Brown, and other veterans of the 272nd Field Artillery Battalion, which was the last segregated unit in the U.S. Army. The park memorializes a standing and clothed Edward O. Gordine and also Massachusetts African American veterans who fought in every war in this country, by this country, since the American Revolution. Over the past month, many of the protest marches that started in Roxbury convened at the park. And it's fitting that they did so, since thousands of African American veterans from the Civil War, World War I, and World War II were targeted for racial assault, death, and lynching. Uh, the commission has our written testimony, so my comments this evening are limited to two concerns. First, we hope that the commission acts deliberately, thoughtfully, and with a full understanding of the historical and artistic context for the statute. This will require that the process for considering the removal be a bit more inclusive. The history behind the statute is very rich, but also being very complicated. Charlotte Scott, Archer Alexander, 
Frederick Douglass, Black veterans of the Civil War, who not only donated the bulk of the funds for the original statue, but also created a college for veterans returning from the Civil War. It would be a disservice to their memories to act without a full understanding and acknowledgement of this history. <clears throat> In our written testimony, we suggested, for example, that the commission collaborate with Ibram Kendi, the new director of Boston University's Anti-Racist Center. And through such a deliberative and inclusive process, the commission also may be able to develop criteria for deaccessioning other problematic works from the city's public art collections. Second, and most importantly, through broader collaboration and outreach, the commission would be positioned to address the greater challenge it has before it. And that challenge is how to transform and redress the systematic inequality in the city's entire public art collection as noted in its 2018 report. And it's interesting that to counter this acknowledged inequality, the Gordine Project has been heralded as one of the three African-American projects that are in development. However, it has been in development since December 2016, when the commission provisionally approved the project. And I can confirm that the current process for obtaining review and final approval is unnecessarily exhausting, if not at times demoralizing. If there was ever a time calling for completing the African American Veterans Memorial, now is the time. So I appreciate the commission addressing the removal of the emancipation statute. However, the commission's real work has yet to begin around race, around equity, and around community. And only as a result of a very deliberative and thoughtful work process with broad and collaborative community input can the public arts program be re-envisioned and recreated to enrich and enhance all of Boston's communities? Thank you. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Um, I'd now like to invite Byron Rushing to um, make testimony. Byron? I'm just checking to see if I'm unmuted. Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. And it's a uh, uh, a pleasure uh, to be before you in this virtual way. I believe the statue, the Emancipation Group, should remain where it is and that its history and the history of the controversies which have revolved around it be told in as public ways as possible. My request to the Boston Arts Commission then is that you do not order or allow its removal and that you oversee the interpretation of this public art owned by the city of Boston. Of those two requests, I will spend my remaining time attempting to speak to the second, the telling of the history of the work and the history of the interpretation of the work. I suggest you and we start there in making any decisions about the future of this work. Public art, as you know, when it is erected to commemorate a person or an event is designed with the assumption that no one at the time and no one in future generations will not know why it got put up in the first place. And that's why you see so little statuary with original descriptions of why it's there other than maybe a name. And of course, that's not true, and most times we don't fix it. I'm going to, in my written remarks, go into some detail about how this was addressed by the committee for the restoration, the first restoration of the Robert Gould Shaw 54th Regiment monument that was done in the late 70s, early 1980s, because they figured out that about the ignorance of the community and especially visitors about that monument and added additions to it at that time to do just that, to be labels. But I ask the commission, regardless of what it decides about the physical placement of the statue, 
to decide immediately to maintain its public interpretation, increase its public interpretation, tell its story, but above all, tell it factually. I listened to all the testimony uh, at the last hearing and I was moved by all the incredible concern and response to this piece, but I was always through it out all concerned about the lack of historical knowledge about its origins. And it is at this time, the owner's responsibility. And that means that the city should do the interpretation, tell the history, engage people and academic historians and average people in telling that history, but let's get the history told. If that truth telling can occur, then the emancipation group in place where I would like it to be or move will still be able to tell a story. But this is really essential that the history go with the monument. Do not move this monument until we are agreed on a factual history of this monument. Don't put it in storage. Well, don't put it in storage no matter what, because this commission has, a, their, your predecessors have a terrible reputation when it comes to storing things. Just ask any resident in Roxbury about the Warren statue. So no matter what you do, do not move this until you know where it is going. Do not move this piece until you have a history that goes with it. There are only two museums in my lifetime in this city that have ever put on an exhibit about race. I'm not talking about including black subjects or including black artists in a museum. I'm talking about the subject of race. And that museum, of course, was the Science Museum, which was the only museum that has ever done a scientific exhibit on race and on racism in this city. Though I might add the, the, the recent exhibit by the Elizabeth Stewart Gardner Museum on Sargent using his black model for all of his white paintings, which I guess is also uh, a, a, a discussion of racism in art. So two museums, but the biggest ones have never done this, never. So be very careful of who you send this to if you want to send it anywhere. But most importantly, make sure that we have with this the answer to the question of the history of its origin and the history throughout the years of its controversy. So let me um, just say this <clears throat> in closing. When I worked at the Museum of Afro-American History, we had a sign up in our galleries and it had words like this. For this museum, history means people and events through time. We do not know where we are if we cannot remember where we have been. We can't make informed decisions about where to go if we can't recognize where we are and where we have been. History is time, past, present, and future. I urge you, let's do the history first. Thank you so much, Byron. Gave us a lot to think about. Kevin Tucker, you're next up. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Tucker, and uh, I'm a member of the Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War. And uh, I'm a descendant of a uh, Civil War veteran from Dorchester uh, who was with the 11th Massachusetts uh, Volunteer Infantry in the war. One of the, uh, aside from being a past department commander in now Massachusetts, or very, sorry. I'm sorry? Is that let everybody know? Oh. Um, uh, one of my, uh, Positions in uh, my organization is the uh, National and Department Monuments Officer. My organization preserves Civil War monuments. Um, uh, so part of what we do is uh, we, we go around uh, cataloging them, uh, 
and then assessing the condition and then putting together a plan to restore them. And uh, obviously this monument is, the one in Boston is beautiful and doesn't need any restoration. I believe that the uh, Park Plaza Hotel restored it a few, uh, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, and it's in great shape. Uh, so my thought on this, and uh, it's going to, going to be tough following the uh, previous two speakers. Uh, so my thought on this was, uh, I think some of it is that it suffers, some of the criticism is that it suffers from uh, the angle at which it's viewed. So the one in Washington DC is on a 10 foot pedestal and the one here in Boston is on a six foot pedestal. And so part of what it's trying to show you isn't really visible or not, not well visible. And the angle that you have is a bad angle. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the figure of the slave is supposed to be looking ahead to uh, freedom and he's just broken the chains that he was holding. He's positioned next to a whipping post and that chain chained him to that whipping post. So he's broken away and he's starting to rise. Uh, that was the intention anyway. He's starting to rise from that position. Uh, that was uh, part of the original commission of the statue. They changed it from originally Thomas Ball had modeled it as a kneeling slave. The, the uh, people who commissioned it, including those uh, what you used to call U.S. colored troops from Natchez, Mississippi, that paid the bulk of the cost for this. They actually became what, what we know as the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, they wanted to make sure that on that monument, it showed them participating in their own emancipation. They fought for their freedom. They fought for the freedom uh, of their brothers. And they, so Thomas Ball changed that piece of it. The problem that you have looking up at that statue from you know, t uh, t 10 feet down or six feet down is you're not seeing exactly what that's showing. So I'm not for moving it either. I think they cited it perfectly. They wanted to, it to be uh, within sight of uh, the state house. I think that historical markers would make a huge difference uh, in explaining just what you're looking at because I understand just walking by not having any context it does it is it can be a little troublesome a little confusing about what it's trying to show but um, what Thomas Ball was trying to do it was a it was a tribute to Abraham Lincoln just after his assassination um, and it was it was really showing one of his greatest uh, achievements, which was the, the, the Emancipation Proclamation, um, which was the first step. It was just a start. Excuse but, me, Kevin, um, yes. can you wrap it up for us? We're at about three minutes now. Oh, sorry about that. I could go on. Uh, so I hope that, uh, that we'll consider putting the markers in and, uh, and keeping it where it is. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Okay, next on our list is Kenzie Bach. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Actually, can I just remind you, we're going to really try to hold it two minutes. There's a lot of people who want to talk. Sure, we'll, we'll okay. try. Um, I, I'm uh, Kenzie Bach. I'm the um, city councilor for District 8, and also uh, grew up around the corner from the statue in Bay Village. Um, and I wanted to speak very briefly tonight, um, both from the perspective of being a child growing up near the statue and from the perspective of a counselor and actually as a historian, um, I have my PhD in history as well. Um, and uh, I think the first thing I'd say is I just, I'm a historian um, and, I, and I really appreciate um, Representative Rushing's comments about the history and the context of this. But I do also think it's important to recognize that our, statu our statuary, whatever it is, gives people an effective experience and I think that the effective experience of this statue is an uncomfortable one, um, and spe specifically an uncomfortable one for our, you know, black citizens of Boston. Um, but I can say that just from personal experience that growing up around it, um, a couple of blocks away, I have felt my whole life uncomfortable about the depiction and the kind of racial um, dynamics at play. And I think that, I think that it is possible for us to learn the history such that we understand what, as the previous speaker said, this statue was trying to achieve. And we understand um, kind of this overall context around it. But I'm not sure that that counterbalances that affective experience for the viewer enough for it to make sense to keep the statue where it is. Um, and, and I say that partly because I think, and this is what I know the commission is considering and you spoke to in your presentation, 
you really have to think about the overall context of monuments in the city. And I think that if we had lots of monuments in the city that were speaking to black liberation in a more empowering way that were showing African Americans in, um, in a position of strong agency, that it would be easier to then contextualize this one as sort of, you know, a moment of its time and, and trying to show some of the things the previous speakers alluded to. Um, I think because frankly, there's a huge deficit on that front um, that we have to, we have to really consider, you know, if I'm, I, I think a lot as the counselor for, um, for the Boston Common and the Public Garden about the fact that those are parks and this is a central part of the city that should really be for everyone, um, not just for the largely white community that lives in immediate proximity to it. Um, and so I think about what's the experience of, uh, you know, of a young uh, black person walking around and I just feel like the, um, having been not a young black person, but a young white person sort of cringing at this statue my whole life, I, I, um, I worry that leaving it in its current position, even with historical contextualization, doesn't, doesn't right that wrong or correct that dynamic. Um, so my instinct on this statue would be that it should be removed from its current location. I wanna put a strong um, vote in favor, however, of maintaining it in the commission's collection and finding a place in the city to appropriately historically contextualize it. Um, I do think that this, that, you know, national history is our history in Boston too, and that Lincoln is an important figure and that emancipation is an important moment. And actually one of the things that has come up in the discussion of Juneteenth in the last few weeks is how, how little that emancipation history is known. Um, and so I think, you know, I think that providing an appropriate historical um, context around the statue and having it at a site where people can go and learn about it um, is important. And um, and that and that there's a lot that there's a lot that folks can learn from that. Um, and also, I always think as a historian that actually just teaching people to even think about how uh, a monument from the past could have meant different things in that time it teaches us to think more carefully about our own time and what assumptions we make um, and and what assumptions we make about how we express ourselves um, that might not hold true forever. Um, so I would just strongly um, and, and I do think that. Um, I do think that anything that goes in the place of this statue at this location um, needs to be in the context of emancipation and black liberation and has to take that opportunity of that sight line to the state house and really own it um, in a major way. And I think should be specifically historically connected, right? Not just an expressive piece, piece of art, but something that, um, that uses that monumental location in the way that frankly, the people who cited the statue originally intended to use that location. Um, so, for what it's worth, that those would be my my comments. Is I, I do think there is an argument for taking the statue down from its current location. I do think that the city should maintain it and put it in a public place with, as um, Representative Rushing suggests, really appropriate historical context. And I think a plan on that front should be made um, as part of any plan to move it. Um, but uh, but that would be uh, my take on this. And I just finally want to end with really thanking the commission for this public process. Um, I, I imagine there will be continuing. You know, public process and conversation ongoing, but and and certainly I know that myself and Councillor Flynn are eager to be partners in that. Um, but I, I I'm very grateful to you all for running this Zoom, and I'm sure having kept time on these recently myself that I am well over two minutes. So I'll uh, thank the chair and um, have thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, appreciate your input. Uh, next on our list will be Cedric's iPad. Uh, Cedric, if you're out there, your name is under Cedric's iPad. Um, we're not hearing from you. Um, okay, I think maybe somebody doesn't know that they're on the list. Oh, oh, oh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you see me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Because I'm new to all these guys. You know, I'm a layman when it comes to this. My name is Cedric Turner, and uh, I'm the great, 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 great grandson of Archer Alexander. Uh, but And so is Muhammad Ali, who is my first cousin. Um, I didn't want to get into to this debate the way it is now, but I am. And let me just, because I, I have a tendency to, to run my mouth too long and not get to the point. So I need to abbreviate myself as a writer, because I am a writer. I went down to Washington, DC. Oh, I want to thank Megan Irons of the Boston Globe for keeping me abreast of everything that's going on. I went down to Washington, DC during the uh, on Friday and to rush right straight through 
uh, without making it long, uh, a, a, a long story, making it a long story. I was uh, stopped from being able to speak uh, about how I feel about bringing this, this, this statue down. Um, and I saw two elements there that were stopping me. Well, one that was stopping me for sure. Um, the, the extreme left Antifa that was really in control of this, that entire event down there in the Lingham Park. And then there was an element that was keeping ironically quiet and on the fringes. And I didn't know who they were until uh, I spoke and discovered, along with the media, conservative media, who rushed onto me. And you, you can see all this on my Facebook page, um, Cedric Turner, that their interest was to keep the statue up, but only if they only to 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 support their argument about keeping all the other statues up. Uh, so what I surmised was that this discussion discussion isn't about the statue of Archer Alexander at all. It's about the soul of America, and you have two fractions who are as usual when it comes to, and I'll just say the revolution when it comes to or when it comes to black people, when it comes to the struggle. Let's put it that way by activists, um, uh, they're pulling like a tug of war at the middle class or at the struggle uh, uh, and for their own agenda, for their own purposes. When you go to my page and you see the re reply to what I had to say, uh, you'll find that the extreme right, right had tried to pull out my entire argument for their purposes and their purposes only. Hello? Yeah. yeah. Uh, could you could you maybe focus on your uh, belief with our statue now? Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it, this this is the point I'm trying to make. Um, it should stay up for historical reasons and for the fact that it's been he's been his his life story has been silent for so long. I mean, as as has been, you know, most of Black history, and I just. I'm very passionate about the fact that it should stay up, but if you must take it down, you know, to, uh, you know put, put it into a, a library of, of sorts. I'm not, not a library, but a, a museum of sorts. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm stuttering because I'm so passionate about this, this situation and I've never done this before, so it's new to me. I, um, I just think that it should stay up. Um, for reasons not just because uh, he's, I'm connected to that statue and to Archer Alexander, but because if we allow the debate to, to tear this, the statue down, um, I think we would, would, would be allowing those extreme fractions to, to, to co-opt the, the conversation and take it away from the American public, take it away from the Black Lives Matter movement, which I think has nothing to do with really the core of the Black Lives Movement, has nothing to do with trying to take this down. And I, I, I honestly think it should, should stay up. I'm going to be so mad at myself for doing all this stuttering and, <laughs> thank be, you very much, and, be, and being distracted by this because I want to. Thank you for your um, your comments, especially coming from a family member of Archer Alexander. It's it's fascinating. Yeah. Thank you, um, Aqua. You'll take over the next. Okay, uh, let me invite Anna. Boel Skevby, I hope I said that right. And I just wanna make just another announcement here to please try to keep your comments to two minutes. We have quite a few people in the queue. Uh, so we're gonna be a little bit harder on you from, from now on out. Okay, you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Anna. I don't have a video up. I think someone else didn't. Okay, you can hear me, that's all good. <laughs> My name is Anna Bochkevy and I'm a Jamaica Plain resident. Um, I'm, uh, I wanted to speak about removing the statue. I used to work in the transportation building at 10 Park Plaza. So I used to walk by the statue every single day. And every time I walked by the statue, I felt nauseated. I felt, I did not understand what it was trying to convey. And I spoke to my coworkers recently. I was letting them know that, hey, by the way, they're talking about removing that statue. They said, oh, the shoe shine statue or the Lincoln Jesus 
statue. No one knows what that statue is for. I know there's a plaque there, I know you can read about it, but a lot of the communication, it comes from not just words, it comes from uh, human expression, it comes from body language. The body language of that statue and the human expression of that statue does not convey what is meant to convey, according to Placard. I understand that. And also, um, I read this wonderful article by Raul Fernandez that was published in the Medium, and he mentioned how even Frederick Douglass did not like the statue when it was originally unveiled in Boston. He even, Frederick Douglass even said he wished the slave was stay, standing next to Lincoln. So historically, <laughs> I feel that's credentials there, that there's an issue with this. And um, I would like to say that um, my mother works in the African-American uh, literature department at Boston University. So I can be a resource if there's any issue reaching out to uh, Abraham Kendi or she would you like to do some type of ed educational resources. And I would like to thank the chair and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, now I'd like to invite Holly Tarnower to speak. Holly, are you with us? Yes, hello, thank you. Um, I, I wrote my testimonials. So I'm a little nervous, so I'm just going to read it for you. Um, so, as a lifelong Bostonian and an educator, I believe that this statue is detrimental to our city and anyone who sees it. It is damaging to our citizens, both in the emotional toll it has on our BIPOC citizens and visitors, but in the dangerous representations of white supremacy and whitewash history it depicts. I do not think this statue celebrates black people. I do not think this statue celebrates the freedom of black people. It is a, little, a literal monument of the white savior, one that is historically inaccurate. We have limited space in public for monuments and we must choose what monuments we publicly display. We should choose one that uplifts the BIPOC community as opposed to one that brings them down, which this statue literally depicts. I also strongly, strongly believe that it is not worth keeping this statue in this place for the sake of historical significance. One, this statue is a copy, a, a replica. It is not unique. Two, we can know that this statue existed without it being here, acting as a demeaning eyesore to black indigenous people of color who walk past it every day. And in this time where it is pertinent for white people to properly educate themselves and demechanize their deeply ingrained notions of white supremacy, we also do not need our white citizens and visitors walking past this every day, subconsciously being reinforced in these false and dangerous notions that black indigenous people of color are literally below them and need white people in order to succeed. I believe we can keep this statue for the sake of history, but where it is currently displayed is damaging. I believe we should relocate it to a museum where its entire history, including this very debate occurring as we speak and its many years of criticism can also be explained. Frederick Douglass criticized this speech piece over 140 years ago, and yet it is still being publicly celebrated and taking up valuable space in our city. It is long past time we take it down from its current position. I urge the committee to listen to the thousands of pleas to relocate the statue to a museum where its full history can be shared and replace it in the square with a statue made by an artist of color that depicts true equality, something that we as a city claim to be fighting for. And the time has never been more pertinent. Thank you. So um, I guess I will invite Doris Keevan Frank to speak next. Hello, thank you. And thank you for um, this opportunity. My name is Doris Keevan Frankie, and I'm a historian and a writer and I am the biographer of Archer Alexander. Mm. Um, this uh, story of this monument, um, I don't think is as well known as it should be to explain um, its story. So I appreciate a moment just to explain it briefly. I know that it was given to the city of Boston because of its generosity. The people of Boston donated more funds to the Western Sanitary Commission than any other 
um, place in history. Besides that, both William Greenleaf Elliott with the Western Sanitary Commission and Thomas Ball were natives of your beautiful city. And that was part of the reason that the second monument was made and given to your city. The Western Sanitary Commission um, did serve during the Civil War as a nonprofit, as a relief organization for Union veterans and fugitive slaves that made its way to Missouri and St. Louis, namely. Archer Alexander spent his first 20 years of life in Virginia. He was um, taken to Missouri in 1829, where he spent his next 30 years. This slave, um, after an incident that in itself made him a hero in St. Charles County, where we are very aware of his actions because um, when he overheard his master, knew that um, his master had compromised a local railroad bridge, he risked his life and being lynched to make his way um, to the Union troops to warn them what had happened. This slave then, and to escape lynching, had to flee for his life to St. Louis, Missouri. There he was taken in by the benefactor, the benefactor of William Greenleaf Elliott. William Greenleaf Elliott was with the Western Sanitary Commission. He also worked with Thomas Ball and with um, Abraham Lincoln, um, portrait maker, to make this monument. There was an original monument that did display a slave more kneeling in a soldier's cap and looked even more submissive. It was the efforts of William Greenleaf Elliott to change that perception and make it known that the slave had worked himself to emancipate himself and break his own shackles. That is why he is shown as rising and looking up to the future. And I'd also like everyone to understand that Archer Alexander, while the slaves in 1865 could not do a Facebook poll or, or a presentation like you are enabling today, but Archer Alexander did see um, a picture of that monument and of himself, and he loved it. And he said, I'm free. Yes, it is. Doris, a Doris I want to uh, let you know that you're at almost three minutes. And so I'm going to have to ask you to just finish your comment. And I will uh, conclude on. very quickly. Thank yes, you. it is offensive. I say you should keep it and put another one with today's message next to it to show and educate young people of how far we have come since 1865. And thank you, thank you very much. Okay, Mark, I'm kicking it back to you, you're muted. <laughs> Ibrahim Sandiata is our next speaker. Yes, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, I'm presently in Northeastern Brazil and uh, I'm glad I found out about this meeting. I live in Boston. I uh, am uh, an emeritus professor at Brandeis. I grew up with the original of that statue in Lincoln Park in DC. And the first 10 years of my life were in segregated schools. I had to walk past that statue almost every day. And we kids thought it was creepy. Uh, so I'm glad we're having this debate. My position is that the statue uh, should be preserved, it should be contextualized, and because I think the site is a pokey little site, the statue should be put in a museum with text. Because part of our problem is we don't, I mean, I know there are a lot of art historians in Boston, and I'm not an art, an art historian, but the pose in the statue goes back to a 1788 pose, uh, Am I Not a Man and a Brother? Created an abolitionist campaign in Britain. The pose was used in the Lincoln statue and it comes down to us in various renditions and forms, ending up in the Washington, Washington statue in Tuskegee, Alabama, where a fully clothed Booker T. Washington is standing over a kneeling Negro youth and he's pulling back the veil of Negro ignorance. I find that statue offensive too. Did Ralph Ellison. 
So I think when we have statues like this, which are created at a historical moment, we preserve them, we put them in museums, and we really research them. The problem with our current debates is that history, let's say monuments, monumental statuary as a fashion show is very tricky business. In 2015, the Pope made Junipero Serra a son of the Catholic Church, a move that was herald, heralded by many Hispanic Americans. Today, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and, other, and others, uh, those statues are being torn down, sometimes quite violently. And so if we go with every wind that passes, we begin to have a kind of fashion show in stone. I'm for preserving this statue, which troubled my five-year-old mind, my six-year-old mind, and is still in my memory. At the same time, I do not believe it should be warehoused, uh, forgotten. It needs to have people talk about where the pose came from, why the statue was paid for by Friedman, and basically how that pose, those attitudes, uh, continue the sort of white paternalism inform us. And at the same time, inform us of something very important. I'd like you to ask you to wrap up. Yeah, the past is a foreign country. Mm -hmm. And one man's racism was a mother man's good works. Okay, night from Brazil. Thank you for such long distance comments. Uh, Thalia will be our next speaker. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm Talia Yunan, and I'm a citizen of Dorchester, and my background is in journalism and public relations. Um, and I, I believe that by looking at this statue, uh, one participates in a miseducation. Um, I am 26 years old and grew up under McGraw-Hill textbooks um, that did not teach emancipation, the Emancipation uh, Proclamation correctly and with the context that it should be taught in. And after listening to speakers here, uh, Cedric, Byron, and others, I believe that this statue should be um, either recontextualized at the site. Um, so I've seen talk of temporary installations or installations that re-explain the statue or move to a museum or somewhere where people can learn about the history of this statue the way the politics, um, like who made the final decision, who designed it, what color were they, what race were they. I believe that it's really important to continue to remember America's dark, dark history and, and our current state. Um, I don't think that the statue should be uh, removed from existence. And uh, at the same time, I, I feel that it's a microaggression for anyone, uh, especially black people, Hispanic, like to walk by this statue and see the way that um, this man is depicted in relation to Lincoln as white savior. Uh, I don't feel that that's an experience that anyone should have, um, especially in a city like Boston where um, our, a lot of companies leadership is still white, um, like white leadership is still so prominent in this city and the symbol of the statue I think still remains. So in that way, I feel that this statue should be recontextualized um, wherever it ends up. Okay, thank you very thank much you. for your comments. Uh, Robert Allison will be next. Thank you, thank you commissioners. And I want to, I did send in written testimony so I will try to be brief. I'm an historian, an historian of Boston, and I take my students to see this monument, as well as the Shaw Memorial, the Soldiers and Sailors Monument, and the Harriet Tubman Monument. And it's a way of talking about these issues. And this statue for its time was an attempt to do that. And I think our criticism should not be so much of Thomas Ball and Moses Kimball, but rather of ourselves. We haven't completed the story as far as the public art goes. Where are our monuments to Lewis Hayden and Harriet Hayden, to David Walker, and to 20th century folks who have contributed to this story? That is, I would hope that the Arts Commission would take seriously what's been said about putting more context here around this statue, but also continuing this story to show 
what happens to Archer Alexander. I mean, we've heard from one of his descendants. That's, this is the beginning of a story which continues. And I think that's really what public art should be capturing. I do want to just say one thing that Frederick Douglass's criticism of the statue was not in his speech. It was an extemporaneous comment, which was only first published about six, 60 years later in 1916 in Freeman Murray's book, where he remembered Douglas, or someone remembered Douglas saying he thought the figure should have been standing. But in his lifetime, it's hard to find Frederick Douglass criticizing the statue in that way, really saying it should come down. Douglass recognized the statue for what it was. And it's a brilliant speech he gave about Lincoln. So I think the statue needs to be contextualized. I also would welcome the Arts Commission commissioning works of art that continue telling this story. We have great artists in this city who can tell this story and make it a much richer story. It's unfortunate that for us, the story ends in 1879 when Moses Kimball, for his many faults, did put the statue here. And we have to ask, what have we put in its place? So thank you very much. I've enjoyed listening to the discussion so far. Thank you very much. Uh, so have I. Uh, next up is Sarah Ting. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so first of all, I, I do wanna thank the commissioners and for this open debate. And I, and I really appreciate what Robert just said about the story that we need to tell ourselves. I think I just wanna say that I, what drew me to this debate as I was reading the article, uh, Mayor Walsh had actually said, why not consider a symbol of equality? I think there's a couple of questions that I just wanna pose in this debate. W again, asking ourselves, what is the purpose of public art? And what do we want, what kind of public art do we want that will uplift us and empower us? And do we always have to have a public art piece that speaks that shows a person, that honors a person. Why not have a symbol that promotes equality? So I, I want to offer that in this discussion that why do we have to always think about honoring a person? Why don't we honor a living concept of equality? And also, um, I did appreciate the comment that Rochelle made about the process of the public art process. It's very exhausting. And it doesn't always feel very, very supportive sometimes. Um, some of you may know that my organization has been dedicated for the last 26 years to building a symbol of equality. And so I just want to raise questions. I think that the comments about maintaining this piece, but contextualizing it, because I agree, you cannot totally erase the past. And, it's, and we don't want to do this. We want to acknowledge what happened in the past. And I don't think it, if this is going to make people feel denigrated and less than in Boston, then I think we have to think about that. So I do think it's important to um, preserve our history and understand it. It's important to understand it. And I, a lot of people had made comments about contextualizing it. I support that. And also maybe finding a place where this can still be observed to learn from our past. I think that's critical because if we don't learn from our past, as they say, history then repeats itself. If we don't- Thank you very, thank you very much for your comments. Um, excellent uh, comments. Um, next. Okay, thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, I'm gonna invite Aziza's iPhone. <laughs> Please Hi. join us. Good um, evening, everyone. My name is Aziza Robinson Goodnight, and uh, I'm the current chair for the Frederick Douglass Sculpture Project. Um, a sculpture that I've been working on in tandem with the city um, and United Neighbors of Lower Roxbury for the past 11 years. So I'd like to mirror, mirror the sentiments of um, Sarah Ting on like the process of um, developing sculpture and projects. Um, and also thinking about the emancipation and what I've learned in this process. Um, I didn't even know the name of that sculpture was named Emancipation, whatever it is, um, because that's not what it feels like whenever I saw it. Whenever I w entered that area, it felt daunting, like like I mirrored the sentiments of lots of others. Um, and 
there were many that mentioned that Frederick Douglass um, said that the figure of the, the slave should have been standing. And I, I believe that he did because he also said that he didn't want himself um, being portrayed or, or a white man to depict his image. So I believe that Frederick Douglass said that the slave should be standing because there's nothing freeing about a kneeling slave at a, a white man's feet at that time period. Um, some of the also other things that I've learned in this process was that if it is removed, I believe it should be removed because you can't just put a plaque near that space and believe that people are gonna walk up to it and read it. Um, it does need to be in a museum in an edu space where it can be educated. It, there also be, there needs to be some sort of partnership um, with like schools like BPS um, in educating, in also schools in the suburbs and educating all children about the real history of, of, of all cultures. Um, also, I, I thank the commission for the work that we've done together, but I believe that the city needs to put more effort into making sure that projects, permanent projects of black and brown people that promote positive images of us are happening, not just random public art projects that are temporary. We need long-term projects of things like the Frederick Douglass and like the Veterans Memorial and like the Malcolm X or Martin Luther King sculpture projects. These things need to happen at a speed, uh, more, a faster rate. And the city needs to put more effort. There needs to be more funding dedicated to the process and more education for the process because it's not clear. There are far too many white people trying to depict images or of black people. And that happens through the media, it's happening through sculpture, it's happening all over. Those who control the image that control the mind, there needs to be a more open process around public art and who gets commissions and who depicts the, the images of us as well. So- Aziza, can you wrap it up for us? Yes. So I thank the commission again for all your hard work and I thank you for this public art process. Thank you so much. Okay, now I'd like to invite Ina Fox to speak. Ina, are you with us? Sorry, forgot to unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, thank you. Um, I really appreciate this forum that the, the, the Boston Arts Commission has put together. Um, I must say that um, this conversation that I've heard so far has really um, made me less certain about exactly what I would like done with the statue. So let me say that I have, I commented, I took the survey and um, I was I, I firmly believe I see this the, the statue as really as a monument of its time. It, it the imagery is a type of paternalistic racism, um, but I was not for the removal. And to be honest, at this moment, I'm not exactly sure whether I am for the removal or for keeping it there. Um, and I'll tell you um, the history. When I learned about the history behind the statue and particularly the fact that formerly enslaved, very recently and formerly enslaved Blacks raised about $17,000, which is an incredible sum of money to entirely pay for the commission, was a very powerful and important piece of the history that was, that was missing. And I think that the intent of the, mon of the monument and that um, participation and engagement of the, of the formerly enslaved Black community is really, an important part of the story and the history of this monument and I would want that preserved. And I think that all the debate that's happening now around this monument and others, that it, it indicates how important the public space is for these kind of debates. So, you know, I guess what I'm thinking about is, um, <laughs> since I, I would like to find a way for this public debate to continue with this monument. Um, and whether it's at that site or another site, that's the place that I, that's where I'm not so sure now, having listened to 
a lot of people's comments on this debate right now. I think they raised a lot of good points. Um, um, I think if it is um, removed that I would want there to be some delineated, delineated process so that there can be a public, um, some reinterpretation, maybe some temporary art responses or something that keeps that debate alive. Um, if it's kept in the space, I'm again, I'm concerned about how slow things are to move in terms of like commissioning new artwork, but um, because ideally I would, I would want um, an African American artist to be commissioned to do a piece sort of in counter conversation to that work and have it in dialogue with that piece. But that I know would take a long, long time. So um, <laughs> you know, my, vote, my vote is uncertain. I know we have to wrap up, but yeah. I just, uh, you know, the, the debate around it, I just wanna say, I think that the conversation is really important to preserve and telling that full story is really important. And I appreciate you saying that you're not sure because I'm, I'm sure you're not the only one and it is a, quite a, a large area that we're talking about. So thank you, Ina. <laughs> Um, next, I'd like to invite David Lewis to speak. Hello. Hi, David. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm David Lewis. I'm a sculptor, uh, born and raised on, on the Cape. And um, I work in uh, bronze figurative public art, among other things. I have eight life-size si life um, statues. And just for a quick, uh, quick list, uh, President John F. Kennedy, James Otis Jr., Mercy Otis Warren, Rachel Carson, Jacob Mariano, and a kneeling uh, fireman um, that is on the canal. Um, what I'm proposing, and uh, you guys are going to get a, a thing in the mail tomorrow with um, a sketch that I've done is to remove the kneeling or crouching slave. And I figured out a way that we can, we can get a standing black African-American freed, freed um, um, slave standing just to the left of the president with his right arm extended in front of the president and his finger landing on the Emancipation Proclamation. He is, he is taking um, possession of his freedom, as, as I see it. The statue would have to be removed, taken to a foundry, because there's quite a bit of work that's got to be done. But to remove that figure, and I would um, sculpt, and then we would bra have bronzed um, the, uh, the freed slave. It would then be reattached um, to the existing, uh, what's, what remains of the existing uh, statue. Um, and well, you can't see this, but Lincoln, President Lincoln's left hand is stretched forward um, and in a non-conforming uh, pose. I would cut that hand off and re-sculpt and then have cast a hand that in, is encouraging the, this, this ex-slave uh, in, in what he's doing. It's an encouraging, um, um, position. Um, I've worked with a lot of bronze. Um, I know what I'm talking about with that, and it can be done. After this is all done and completed, then we bring back the new statue with a crane, lower it right back on to where it is now. Um, David, thank you so much for your commentary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Anne uh, Kaminwa to speak. Did they just cut you off? Yeah. Did you just stop? 
Hello, thank you. My name is Anne Kaminwa. Um, I studied architectural design as an undergraduate at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, I'm a published writer and in 2001, I was recognized by Penn New England for a proposal to write an, a book on the history of racism. Um, I carried out research on this topic in Cambridge and Boston, Massachusetts and while living in New Orleans, Louisiana. I am opposed to Tari Bullock's pet petition. The Emancipation Memorial is a beautiful monument that symbolically captures the history it seeks to commemorate. It should stay where it is. Tari Bullock's petition should be dismissed. He is woefully misinformed about this memorial and based on what he says, he does not know Abraham Lincoln from the Confederacy. He does not mention Abraham Lincoln by name on many occasions when he talks about the memorial, which leads me to wonder whether he even knows who Abraham Lincoln is. Well, I think Tori says he would Maria, like you to focus your comments on the piece, not on the not on other members of the community. Um, well, I'm assuming the reason we're having this hearing is because Tori Bullock wrote a petition. No, that's, I mean, that's has not a petition. That's, that's not, not the case. case. We okay have. then, okay then. Um, the man in question's likeness, the kneeling freedman, was modeled on Archer Alexander, who I understand was the last escaped slave caught under the Fugitive Act. This law allowed slave owners from the southern slaveholding states to track their runaway slaves in the northern states. From the work of black writers such as Alex Haley, Nobel Prize winner Toni Morrison, and Alice Walker, we learned that there were times when runaway slaves who were recaptured were severely punished. They were brutally whipped or maimed. I do not know if either of these things happened to Archer Alexander. However, I do know there is no shame if one is brought to, one, brought to one's knees by the force of overwhelming and insurmountable cru cruelty. Choosing to depict the emancipated black man on one knee, Thomas Ball not only borrowed from an iconic image in abolitionist literature, but successfully captured the moment when the emancipated slave is getting up from being down on both knees. He is rising up to stand. If Ball had portrayed the freedman standing, he would not have memorialized what preceded the total freedom that the activist claims he wants. And as a young person, this activist would not have learned this powerful lesson of history that has never left his mind. Okay, thank you. Bullock, very objects, much. Bullock objects to the fact that the freedman is depicted. Again, I, I need to ask you to clock. focus on the, the piece. I'm sorry? Okay. I need to ask you to focus, and could you please wrap up? You're at three minutes now. Um, there's an objection to the freedman being dressed only in a loincloth. Aesthetically, I cannot think of a more efficient way for Thomas Ball to have recorded the origins of black slaves in America among the tribal peoples of Africa than to have clad the slave in a loincloth. Estimates are that two thirds of the African slaves brought to the United States came from Central Africa and the rest came from the West and Northwestern Africa. <clears throat> so, um, my last comment is that people have objected to the fact that the people who, may I speak? People have objected to the fact that the people who donate, the freed slaves who donated money were not part of the designs process. This objection is not contextualized in the time period that the memorial was created or even in the specificity of the event. For example, we read that the statue was caught, cast in Munich. How long would it have taken to get information across the Atlantic? Three months by ship each way. So instead of making sweeping generalizations about the funders of the ventures and how they were treated, how about we start doing some research and find out the facts? Okay, thank you very much for your commentary. Our next You're welcome. will be Monica Alderado-Rondo. Hello, thank you. I <clears throat> was a resident of Jamaica Plain for 10 years and also an educator. I wanted to speak first as a citizen of the city and uh, echo the comments that people have said about the discomfort, the, um, I think horror might be too strong of a word, but the sense of the white 
paternalism, the white savior is what came through to me first. I have really appreciated this debate. Also Tori's um, context that he's given through social media about the debate in this situation because it's given more context, but I will say walking down the street, looking at the statue, none of that is what is visible. As an educator um, at Boston Arts Academy for 10 years, I'm no longer there, so I don't speak for the institution, but my role there was really teaching visual literacy, history, how young artists perceive the world around them and how they then reflect their um, artwork in the world around them and how they communicate. I hear very deeply the history and the intent of this statue. I just question whether in the contemporary context that the intent is successful in what it's trying to communicate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker will be Saskia Van Vactor. Hi, uh, I'll, I'll just be brief. Um, I'm a Bostonian. I'm a teacher, art teacher at an elementary school. I am um, Native American. And um, I just feel like walking around Boston, there's really a lack of representation of Boston's non-white um, citizens or um, people of his in history. As a teacher, I feel like I've used Boston as an extension of the classroom. And when we go around and look at, at sculptures, um, it just shows um, you know, who's memorialized, whose stories are told, whose, whose stories are failed to be told whose dignity is acknowledged. And I feel like the, the, the history of this sculpture is very important, but as an art piece, the impact, I just, I don't think that people read all the information. They see the, the, the work, they are just impacted by what they see. And, and I don't see it as a dignified um, sculpture. I feel like, um, I feel like there's prejudice embedded in the in the in the piece. I, and I urge that the statue be removed and replaced with a statue that commemorates the dignity, heroism, courage of the African American soldiers who participated in gaining their own freedom. And I just don't feel like that's that is shown with this piece. But I feel like it should be saved and put in a museum. And I feel like the history should be there. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Aqua, you'll, you'll take the next one. Sure, sure. I'd like to invite Feda Eid, and I'm taking a chance with your name. I hope I did it justice. Are you with us? Hi. Um, yes, my name is Feda Eid. Uh, I'm a local photographer and visual artist. Um, uh, as an Arab and Muslim American, I never saw positive representation of my culture and faith in the media or in art. Um, I spent a lot of my life combating that painful experience in my own artwork. And I absolutely think the statue should come down. Um, I've heard the testimonies on the 25th from many people in the black community um, who live with the statue every day. And they really brought me to tears um, hearing about the pain it has caused to their children and to so many generations growing up in Boston um, around the statue. Uh, even if it harms one child, this should be, is, it should be enough to take this down. And it's simply not right because children don't understand the context and the education of behind this statue. They're just gonna see an image that represents something painful to them. And that's not fair. Um, and I hope the people emphasizing keeping the statue up for education purposes are putting that same passion into calling their local education counselors and requesting that black history be taught accurately in schools. That is where this knowledge belongs, not in public spaces where they continue to harm people. Education at the expense of pain shows where people's priorities are. Um, and I hope this committee listens to black people that have come forward and sharing their actual experiences with the, um, with the statue and I hope you invest in these voices like Tori Bullock who organized all of us into the space to have these discussions and um, invest in the many many black artists of the city that can um, 
bring empowering art to the space where this statue stands. Uh, we can do better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Feda. Um, I want to just make a short announcement that um, we have about almost 15 people left in the queue. So at this time, we're going to close off the um, request for uh, testimonials and try to get through the next 14 or 15 folks before seven o'clock when we need to take a short break before uh, reflections and deliberations. Before I go to the next person, I was uh, sent this via chat. I want to read it. Um, it's from someone named Morgan. She said she needed to drop for a presentation with Dr. Kende, but wanted to have the chance to say, I was born in Boston and my partner and I lived in the Bay Village community for two years and have always felt that the statue is uncomfortable for the many sentiments shared by others. I am for removing the statue from its present location, contextualizing it in another location and recommissioning a new art piece for the space that truly depicts emancipation of a free man instead of a man in the process of being freed. Thank you and thank you for allowing this dialogue to happen. So next I'd like to invite Dumas Lafontaine to speak. I can see you, so I know you're here. Please. Hi, everyone. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, greetings, everyone. It's really a pleasure uh, to participate in this dialogue. Um, I, I am the consultant for the Frederick Douglass uh, Sculpture Committee, uh, working to build the uh, Frederick uh, Douglass Memorial. Uh, as Ziza mentioned, uh, this uh, public art uh, project uh, before me. Um, what I'd like to point out is that um, in, in my judgment, the sculpture, uh, the memorial does not uh, uh, convey the uh, integrated society that um, uh, the abolition of slavery uh, was supposed to bring. Uh, therefore, I, I, I support um, its removal uh, in, in place uh, in a museum with, with some context. Uh, I also must uh, give uh, kudos to all of you on, uh, on the committee um, for the support uh, that we've received uh, for the Frederick Douglass uh, sculpture. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dumas. Now I'm inviting someone who has the last four digits on their phone number of 8645. I'm sorry, that was me by accident. I didn't know if I got into the uh, oh, Zoom. I see. So you can okay. at least I spoke. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Sarah. Then next is Greg Ux. Are you with us? Yep, right here. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so yes, my name is uh, Greg Ux, and I just wanted to provide some some context. Um, September eighteenth, eighteen fifty eight, in the debate with Stephen Douglas, Abraham Lincoln said, "I will not say that I am." nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. August 14th, 1862, to an audience of five black freedmen at the White House, on this broad continent, not a single man of your race is made the equal of a single man of ours. The Emancipation Proclamation itself was not a universal act of benevolence. It's well known to historical scholars as a military and political strategy to help win the Civil War. Even as these objectively segregationist attitudes and racist ideas oozed from the highest office in the land, some 200,000 black men would tear off their shackles, rise off their knees, and fight in the Union Army and Navy. And how were they viewed? Still kneeling, still chained, in loincloths, waiting for a white god. So as you can see, this monument in question is hardly about celebrating emancipation. On the contrary, it's about the maintenance of the social order that Lincoln envisioned. It's about the maintenance of black subordination. It's about the maintenance uh, of reminding that the black body, that it is not only backwards, but also uncivilized, inferior, and belongs on its knees in chains while the white man holds the keys. Just look at how the white god Lincoln looks down on the three-fifths of a man he sees before him. That three-fifths of a man had a name. It was Archer Alexander. He was born a slave and secured his own freedom on his own accord under inconceivable le levels of personal risk. He's also the great, great, great grandfather, as you've heard, of Muhammad Ali. Trust me, this man does not need Lincoln. We cannot let ourselves be selective historians, cherry picking the details we like and discarding the details we don't want to believe because they were selectively omitted. I'm obviously not a person of color. 
I will never know what it's like to walk this earth in brown skin and feel the, all those feelings and experience the aggressions and the blatant systemic oppression that go along with it. But I can sit before you here today and unequivocally state that if this image was supposed to represent me, my family, and my entire race for all of history, I wouldn't rest until it was gone and neither should you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, Mark, you wanna take over? Yes, uh, so our next speaker we'll invite is Emily Holloway. Hi, I'm Emily Holloway and I live in central Massachusetts. If I have any spare seconds left at the end of this, please give them to Tori Bullock who is after me. I just wanted to say that I've learned so much participating in this rich conversation about the Emancipation Group, and I'm really thankful that the Boston Arts Commission has made this dialogue a priority, and I believe that Boston really has the opportunity to lead the way in initiating public dialogue and reimagining public works with more community input. As a public work of art, the Emancipation Group does not invite critical viewing or the thoughtful contemplation necessary to contextualize its harmful imagery. As a sculpture on a public street, the strong visual impact of the Emancipation Group is more likely to mislead passersby than it is to engage them in its complex historical context. For that reason, I believe it belongs in a museum, not on a public street. And I would love to see a unique contemporary work by a local black artist in its place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, next up, we have the speaker, Tori Bullock. Ooh, hi everybody. Uh, first off, I'm just, I just wanna give a big shout out to the commission because this has been an amazing conversation to be a part of. And I'm not sure how many other states in the nation have, are having the ability to have this kind of conversation. So thank you guys. Um, all right, so let's get right to it. Uh, I respect this piece of work. I'm gonna read some notes that I wrote just so I get it all right. But um, I just wanna start off by saying I respect this piece of work. That is not something that I can say that I did at the start of this experience. Um, I respect this artistry. I respect the history. I respect the fact that with everything going on in the world, it has managed to exist for 100 plus years. But all that respect for the history of this piece does not change the fact that it no longer belongs in the public setting and I question if it ever I've had a lot of conversations with people over the past few weeks and without a single doubt, there are two big arguments that I hear that always come up. Number one, apparently this is the single most important investment in black history. People say because our ancestors paid for this, then it has to stay up, it must stay up. To that, I refer to a quote from 2017 article by Raul Fernandez, uh, the $17,000 raised for the memorial was an enormous sum coming from the newly emancipated people. Predictably, None of these donors had any say in the monument's design. Instead, the all-white sanitary commission led by William Elliott turned to Massachusetts-born Thomas Ball, a white guy. Yes, we put our money into it, but we never gave our co-sign because as another amazing member pointed out earlier tonight, it would have taken too long. Uh, the second argument I often hear is he isn't kneeling. He's rising, he's about to stand up. If this were a stop animation or a kinetic sculpture that moved, then yes, he is about to stand up but this is a frozen picture. This man is kneeling, he will never stand up. There is no other memorial in this city that requires viewers to fill in the blanks as to what's about to happen. Why us? This image is problematic because it feeds into a narrative that black people need to be led and freed. A narrative that seems very specific to us for some reason. Why is our trauma so glorified? But let's get back to the kneeling because Abraham Lincoln himself, that I think he was the president. Yes, I know who Abraham Lincoln is. Uh, but Abraham Lincoln himself, he had very specific thoughts on people kneeling to him. This is found in Bloody Crimes by historian James Swanson. On the fall of Richmond, Lincoln toured the city. As he walked, a black man came up to him, fell to his knees and grabbed his hand. Lincoln said, don't kneel to me. That is not right. You must only kneel to God and thank him for the liberty that you'll enjoy in the hereafter. So we have a group of newly freed black people who, st who had no say in the product that they were paying for. We have Frederick Douglass, who had a problem with the imagery because it didn't truly represent freedom, and Abraham Lincoln, who, opposed to, who was opposed to anybody bowing to him. A few weeks ago, Mayor Walsh said that racism is a public health crisis in the city of Boston. I applaud him for that, I truly do. But we cannot say that racism is a public health crisis on one hand, and admit that we see racism as a public health crisis, but at the same time say we do not see what the problem with the statue is. It's an issue, 
all of us are saying it's an issue. I truly respect everybody here and the commission for even putting this together. Those are my words and, and that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you very much, Tori. Uh, our next speaker to be invited is Harrisonia. Harrisonia, sorry if I got that wrong. Is somebody by that handle on the call? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, now we can. Okay, hello, thank you. Actually, it's um, Sonia Harris, it's my last name. Ah, okay. It's my name. Oh, that's <laughs> okay, Harris, Sonia's on the screen, you're correct. So I wanna first thank you all for this opportunity and presenting this platform this evening. I especially want to thank Tori Bullock for uh, putting this petition out in the community and raising awareness in the black community. Otherwise, I would not have known about this forum. So thank you very much, Mr. Bullock. I also want to thank a few people who spoke before me. I don't wanna forget them. It's David Lewis. I appreciate your commentary about reconstructing the statute. Fida, Greg Ux, am I saying your name right, Greg? And um, that's it right now and everyone else, again, thank you. So I wanna start by saying quickly that pictures tell stories. And that's something that we teach children at a very elementary uh, foundational level in uh, learning. Pictures tell stories. And in this current climate of racial injustice, everything is left to interpretation. And for me, that would be a uh, regression if I was to look at this statue and question opposed to progress. A lot of people are suggesting that we either remove the statue and place it in a mu museum and give it context. I can agree with that. And I also like David Lewis's idea of reconstructing the statue and also showing the uh, black man in a more dignified position. Um, that being said, if the statue is supposed to memorialize freedom, then the image should represent synergy of valor on behalf of Abraham Lincoln and dignity on behalf of the emancipated slave. I think the statue should be either relocated to a museum with the context to communicate the intended purpose of the image. And we have to be careful when we talk as educators and we are in the community and we're out on field trips because we have to remember it is not the ancestors, it is not the slave or it is not the black community who is given the interpretation of the statue. It is the person who is speaking. And most often that person is non-black. So I want to always consider who's speaking and who's telling the story and whose agency is at the forefront of that story. And once again, oftentimes, it isn't the black person's agency. So please thank you and take all of that into consideration. Great, thank you very much, Sonia. You're um, welcome. Aqua, you'll take the next. Sure. Um, I'd like to invite Reverend Mignard Culpepper to give testimony. Mignard, are you with us? Or I should say Reverend Culpepper. Pepper, are you with us? We're not hearing you. Did, I, did I unmute myself? Okay, there you go. We can uh, hear you. There we go. Okay. Uh, we can see you as well. Hey, great. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. Doing well. Good. 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 Um, I wanted to first thank the commission for um, holding this uh, hearing in a prompt way. I thank all the commissioners. I, I've known equal since we were uh, young kids running up and down Humboldt Avenue, Washington Park. And uh, I was born in Boston. Uh, my grandfather is the founder and the uh, builder of the Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. And uh, ministers and pastors had a press conference last week uh, regarding that statue. Uh, there were five organizations that the, came together. Um, the Clergy United, there was a representative uh, from the Mass Council of Churches, the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, uh, the Boston Baptist Ministerial Alliance, uh, Ministers in Action, and also uh, Black Ministerial Alliance. Uh, and we came together because uh, we wanted to say it loud and clear uh, that the faith community uh, believes that that statue must come down. One of the things that I did uh, before we decided to have the press conference, I went down there really paid attention to the statue. Uh, 
because I had been by that statue many times, running back and forth to legal, running between the commons. And one of the things that I hadn't noticed was that the former slave still had the chains on his hands. And one of the things that did to my soul when I saw him kneeling on one knee, uh, half dressed uh, with chains still on him, it really told me that the young folks that are fighting today, the protests, the fight that we're in today is really for taking down racism, taking down inequality, taking down discrimination, and we've got to take those chains on our hands. And it really took me back a long way to see those chains still on his hands. How can you be free from the bonds of uh, slavery, the bonds of being taken from Africa, the bonds of picking cotton for years in the South, and you still have those chains on your hands? And so as an African, and when I saw those chains still on him, emotionally, it took me back to my forefathers and my foremothers that worked so hard, that fought so hard. It took me back to the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King and John Lewis and Ralph Abernathy and, yeah, and my grandma. I hate to interrupt you, but you're okay. over, it you're took over me your back. time. <laughs> Let me just could, say that. If you Until can just Right. Until we take those uh, chains off of his hands, uh, physically, those chains, for every child that walks by and sees those chains will still have the change on his mind. And so we must take that statue down because in order to really be free, we've got to have those chains taken off, not just physically, but thank emotionally. You so, thank you so much. God Reverend bless Paul you. Pepper. It's good thank to you see you. I'm going to move on no, to, good to, uh, good to see you. Thank Jamada you Smith. Jamada, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. First of all, quickly, um, I really have a, even a greater appreciation for the Boston Arts Commission because you have to make a decision. Um, and I really appreciate it. I, after being on the 25th also and listening to the, I had one way and then listening to all of the, especially the younger people, I, I started changing my mind a little bit, a little undecided. And, um, but I'm beginning to feel that the, the time is now. And in order to fix some things, you have to just make a radical change. And I have seen my great grandmother, my grandmother was born in 1897. I have seen my grandmother, my great grandmother, my, and I have a great granddaughter. So I have seen seven generations. And never have I seen young people like I see now, black, white, and every color. And these kids are not playing. And I think that we should not step aside, but I think we should listen to them. And what I hear most of all from these young people is that we need to fix this thing. It's been 400 years. And then we talk about historical knowledge. Everyone knows, it's not in the books. But the people came over, they weren't allowed to read, they weren't allowed to speak their own language, they weren't allowed to speak the English language. Who in the heck has a history of what really happened? It's his story. So you cannot really expound on the historical perspective when whose perspective is it? Okay, and so, and then the other thing I'm gonna say very quickly is that it, um, it just, it just doesn't feel right, it doesn't look right, and it isn't right. And I think that Tory, and I think that Reverend Culpepper and the, 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 the interfaith community, they're spot on. Thank you. Thank you, Jamada. Um, I'm going to invite Hannah Bassett to speak. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. That was an amazing word. Um, my name is Hannah Bassett. I'm a resident of Haverhill, Massachusetts. I currently attend Howard University in Washington, DC. So for those of you who don't know, that is a historically black college university. It's about 90% black. Um, it's an amazing university. And 
I think Tori did an amazing job of recounting the real history that is behind both figures in the statue. I am mortified at the vision of that statue. It is demeaning, it is degrading, regardless of what the intentions were. It is important to note that the intentions were white-based intentions, as it was a white-created statue. I think if the city truly wanted to contribute to the Black Lives Matter movement, truly wanted to listen to Black voices, then Black voices should, should be the primary ones on the table when discussing this statue. It's us who see it. It's us who, who um, are depicted in it. And it's us who should have a majority of the say over whether it gets taken down or not. Obviously, we've had a huge discussion today, a great discussion on what public art is used for. Um, art, obviously, is always open to interpretation. Public art has a responsibility to depict accurate history, which, as Greg mentioned, the idea of Lincoln as an abolitionist, period, is completely <laughs> false, <laughs> regardless of um, the Emancipation Proclamation that he signed. Completely false. You can do that just by reading his words verbatim. Um, I have the utmost respect for the man depicted in the statue. I think it's important for us to note while we discuss this, that was an enslaved man, not a slave. He was an enslaved man. It's important to note that slavery was not a black condition. Slavery was a show of white immorality and that's all. Um, so yes, an enslaved black man who should have never been there. Um, I think even trying to erect a standing up <laughs> enslaved man next to Lincoln still contributes to the idea of white paternalism in the country, still contributes to the idea that white people invented Black America, contributes to the idea that white people didn't completely wipe away our entire culture, completely whitewash the books, scrub them clean of all the ugly and disgusting things that happened during slavery that were not taught. Nobody teaches you in schools that Black people existed as lampshades and purses and wallets, that cannibalism happened a great deal during the time of slavery by white people of people that they didn't even consider to be human. And that's what the statue depicts. Public art has a responsibility to depict accurate history. Art in a museum has the responsibility to depict art that is up for interpretation. But the black existence is not something up for interpretation. Racial injustice is not a political tool, is not a is not a condition of our society. It's not, up, it's not up for debate. Black freedom isn't up for debate. The same way that leaving this statue up is not up for debate. Having it be a part of our everyday lives for so many years is astounding to me as somebody that's lived there and that's lived in Massachusetts my entire life. It's our responsibility as a community to uplift and listen to black voices, young and old, and to execute, um, a writing of the wrong that was done with this statue um, being put in place in the first place. And that doesn't mean that I don't have a respect for history. I absolutely do. I love history. I'm a political science major and a history minor. But we have a responsibility to do that accurately. And so leaving the statue up would be a complete affront to um, kind of the movement that we're seeing right now. And I think it's important to note that while this is an extremely important discussion, removing the statue is performative if nothing comes out of it. And so if we don't replace it with something else, then it's completely performative activism, which we don't want to engage in. So I encourage you guys to continue to have these discussions. This has been really fruitful for me. Um, but no, this is not an accurate depiction of what happened, nor is it an accurate depiction of Black people, period. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Mark, can you um, take over now? Uh, our next speaker on the list is Sam B. Sam B, if you're still on the line, please. Yes, can you guys hear me? Yes. So I'm gonna keep things short. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone who spoke. Uh, this is very informative and I've learned a lot so far. Uh, but I just wanna leave you guys with one question. Uh, what was Lincoln's true reason behind emancipation? Was it to free African-Americans? Was it to win the Civil War? What was the reason? And if we don't have a concrete reasoning, a uh, concrete answer behind that question, then I think having that statue up celebrates a complicated history. 
And if we have a complicated history that has uh, numerous interpretations, just like the last speaker said, then we should place it in a museum where people are free to have their interpretation met, uh, not in a public space where uh, a concrete answer is given. Uh, and in too many times throughout our history, uh, black people have been placed in subservient positions and that statue continues that heritage of placing black people in subservient positions. So uh, back to the, the question I had is, to the question that I, that I gave to you guys is, what's the true reason behind that statue and what's the true reason behind Lincoln's emancipation? Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, next speaker up is Kristen Perilla. Kristen, unmute yourself. You still seem to be muted, maybe, or we can't hear you. Oh, no, I'm on. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank the committee for this time. I did send an email statement, so this should be super brief. Um, I'm speaking as kind of a quote unquote regular citizen of Boston, in that I mean that I'm not a historian, artist, journalist, educator, or politician, but I am a direct descendant of many Union soldiers along with Mayflower descendants. So in that sense, I do understand the good and the bad history of not only our country, but Boston in particular. I have walked by this statue many times as a resident and never saw this as a white savior or other white supremacist depiction but as its original depiction, freedom and emancipation. I understand though, I am a white person and I can't say how it feels as a black person to walk by it and I'm not gonna pretend to. What I do find sad and upsetting is that so many people of all races don't know the original meaning, history or significance of this statue. That freed slaves were the majority donors of the original cast, um, condoned the design and gifted this should mean something and should be respected in my opinion. I don't agree with removing the statue at all, given those important significances, but if it is voted to be removed, that it be placed um, in a place of distinction along with contextualizing. Thank you to the committee for allowing this process. Okay, thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is uh, Cindy Seen. Sorry if I get that wrong. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Commission. It's Cindy J. Seenay. Um, I am a um, Boston native. I grew up in Boston and I'm very proud to be from such a history rich city. Um, I also have a lot of pride in having been born in the Republic of Haiti, uh, which is a nation that was created by the first enslaved uh, men and women fighting for their own um, liberation from bondage. Uh, and what is not commonly known is that Haitian soldiers also fought in the Civil War, being part of the Buffalo Soldiers that Mr. Kevin Tucker um, mentioned earlier, um, helping to liberate their still enslaved brothers and sisters here on the North American continent. I support the removal of the Emancipation Group from public view uh, for three reasons. One, Visually, that history is lost, um, as was stated by a lot of commentators before. Um, secondly, the men and women who built this nation off their blood, sweat, and tears deserve a far more honorable memorial. And last but not least, this is Massachusetts. We are Boston, almost creamy. It is a very poor replica, and I believe that we should have our own a memorial, a newly commissioned work of art, um, which would be a symbol of equality, showing a black man um, standing up um, honorably. And, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Aqua, you'll be, you'll take the last two. Aqua. I apologize. Erin, Jania, I see you. Uh, Hi. Love to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Erin Jania, and I am a current artist in residence for the city of Boston. I'm a member of the Sisseton Wapaton Oyate, which is a tribe of Dakota people. And 
I uh, wanted to testify today because I want to bring up a perspective that I have not yet heard. Um, so uh, my perspective as a Dakota person, when I see that statue, I don't see emancipation, I see genocide. Um, I see the president who ordered the largest mass execution of my people. 38 Dakota leaders were hung in Mankato, Minnesota in 1862. Um, ever since that time, my people have been living on reservations. I don't see history, I see mythology, and I see that white supremacy that is so deeply ingrained in our culture. We live in a country and city reeling from institutional racism today, and when I see this sculpture, I see a representation of where we are right now. Um, that's what it represents to me. I uh, think that we should have a museum specifically for these kind of monuments, but I think we should get them out of the public space um, where they are so damaging to people coming in contact with them. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. And then finally, uh, Zachary Z. String from Rochester, or is it Zachary Z. String, Rochester? Zachary Z. String, Rochester. Okay, <laughs> That's Zachary. not my actual middle name, but I I'll just go with that for right now. Um, All right, great. You guys can see me, right? Yes. All right. So uh, my name is Zachary Rochester. Um, I'm a resident of Mattapan, Massachusetts. Um, I am also a uh, proud uh, uh, fellow alumni of Boston Arts Academy along with Tori. Um, shout out to all the Boston Arts Academy and individuals that have been on here. Um, I'd first like to start by saying I am a person of mixed heritage. This is my father over here. This is my mother over here. <laughs> and these are my two children. Um, right there, and I, <clears throat> I want to start off by saying that uh, while this meeting was happening, um, I asked my children a very uh, pointed question about, well, it, actually, it was a very simple question about the image um, represented in the statue we're discussing today, and um, this, was, uh, this was my son's response. What did you say? So it kind of looked like um, the, it kind of looked like since um, Abraham Lincoln was white, it kind of looks like um, Abraham Lincoln is uh, superior as in like white people are in superior and uh, black people are inferior. Um, and my daughter, who doesn't want to get on screen, doesn't want to say anything. Her first response, <laughs> you don't have to say anything, sweetheart. Um, her first response was, that's just wrong. And... I bring up these points simply because <clears throat> it's, as we all have known, as we have all um, been taught throughout the years, um, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. And it doesn't matter how many words you put on a plaque, if you walk by or you drive by an image it is ingrained to you subconsciously. And as there's been studies that have shown that imagery that is in our peripherals goes into our subconscious. And whether or not people decide to educate themselves or engage with that particular piece of art, it is part of their consciousness. And when actually, uh, they've never seen this statue before and I, I, that's why, or they've never in interacted with the statue before. And when I show them this image, uh, during this meeting, that was their first interpretation of it. And I'm glad that they felt that there was some, I'm glad that it emoted something in them, but it also shows to me that they also don't necessarily have an understanding of what the statue is. I, for that reason, I propose that it is removed, but put into a controlled environment such as a museum in which it can be the history of the statue and the history of the amazing contribution that freed slaves made to its commission or to the commission of the original and copies thereof is actually contextualized because as we all know, a text with no context is a pretext for a proof text. Um, and what that basically means is if we don't understand the context in which it was created, we end up in a situation like we are here today. And we're discussing these things here and now with a lot of us not knowing the history of the statue. But the thing is, it's public art, it's public 
um, ingestion. So I would just uh, like to leave it there. I appreciate the time that the commission has given me. Thank you. Thank you, Zachary, and thank you to your children as well. For their testimony. <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mark, I think we're ready to. Yes, so uh, our next step now is actually a, a short break. We'll be taking a 10 minute break. Um, and first, before we do that, I wanna thank all the participants who've made some insightful, thoughtful, passioned responses. This mirrors um, some of what we heard uh, in last week's meeting, as well as much of what we've read uh, in the documents to date, the same level of uh, a kind of elevated level of discussion that I think we should all be proud of um, that distinguishes Boston as a place where um, you know we're, we're respectfully uh, disagreeing with one another and also offering uh, insights on the piece. Those will shape how we as commissioners uh, view the work. So we thank you for the time that you've given uh, to us so generously. Um, so now we'll break for 10 minutes. Uh, we'll come back at 7.20 and we'll be beginning with uh, commissioner reflections. After hearing all the testimony, we'll ask each commissioner uh, to reflect on their thoughts on the statue. Uh, and then we'll continue on with the agenda after that. So we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you all.
Okay, it's uh, time to return. Uh, I hope everybody got a short break in and uh, stretched out and uh, gave a little bit of uh, thinking to what we've been hearing for the last two hours. Um, we're going to now uh, move on to uh, the segment where we ask uh, each commissioner if they would like to, um, to make uh, a statement or um, uh, uh, a reflection on uh, what they've heard and also their thoughts in general um, and keeping in mind that commissioners have not only heard what you've said today, but they heard conversations uh, last Thursday. They've read letters. Uh, we've been diving into our own archives. We've uh, reviewed our report and we've had some discussions in the last meeting. Um, so I just want to say that this meeting is a kind of culmination of work that dates back to 2018 on this sculpture. Um, uh, as was presented earlier. Um, and so I'd like to hear from each commissioner uh, in the sequence that we've outlined here um, uh, and to take a few minutes to comment uh, uh, and make reflections. So um, Bob Freeman has uh, agreed to be our first. Uh, we put him on the spot. Uh, he was willing to be on the spot. Uh, but Bob, would you take it from here? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, I, I'd also like to uh, thank the people who gave such eloquent uh, testimony today. Um, and the commission really needs to hear from you. Um, we did, and you can change our hearts and our minds. And so I really appreciate all that was said. Um, last week, I thought about whether we should remove the statue or whether the statue should stay. And I was in the camp of keeping the statue, um, uh, reinterpreting the, uh, the written material, and perhaps placing another statue that commemorated the 200,000 plus soldiers, black soldiers uh, that fought in the Civil War. Um, in a sense, uh, changing the inscription. After hearing two mothers last week and several people today uh, talk about bringing their children down, even Zachary today, who had his children speak, um, Two of the mothers came to the statue and their son said, that statue looks like dad. And the other said, it looks like me. And then I realized that changing the inscription is not going to change the visual power of what art does. So I have changed my mind and I am for now the removal of the statue to a safe place and hopefully a museum might be able to take it, um, but that's yet to be seen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, our next speaker will be Camilo Alvarez. Are you, do you want to make a statement? Hello all, and thank you so much. I appreciate all the input from the public and as well as the incredible conversations uh, via the media and also among the commissioners. Uh, this is an incredibly important time. And this moment of reflection into the past is incredibly important in order for us to move into the future. Um, obviously the public is clamoring for something to happen with the sculpture. I personally uh, would like to see it be kept, but because of the clamor, I think it def definitely needs to be recontextualized as to what we do with it. I hope we can find a home where it can probably be re recontextualized. And in those efforts, I think the public will also be necessary to help us maybe perhaps find a future home for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Camilo. Um, next, Michael Canizzo, would you like to make a statement? Um, I just want to thank everyone for their very thoughtful and heartfelt uh, comments. Um, beyond that, I'm still debating uh, the status of the piece. So um, I just uh, want to listen to more from my fellow commissioners, uh, read more of the comments um, before I make um, any further thoughts or comments about the piece itself. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, next, Cara Elliott Ortega, would you like to have a reflection? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, first, I just want to thank everyone who participated today, whether it was through the meeting, uh, through the meeting last week, or by sending in testimony or taking the survey. 
A few people today mentioned that their opinion shifted over the course of the last two hours, and I think it really speaks to the sincerity of everyone's participation and also just how much we're listening to each other. Um, so I want to say thank you to everyone for creating that atmosphere and, and just bringing so much care and consideration to the, to the conversation that we're having together. And I also want to elevate some of the comments that urged us to think beyond this specific artwork to the work that really lies ahead for all of us here, which is how we assess and advocate and really shape the public art collection and how histories are represented in the public realm more broadly. Um, so this includes how the city and the art commission actually commission new works, but I think it also includes some of the amazing projects that have been generated by our community that really deserve to be embraced and really finding a way to um, give them the support that, yeah, that they deserve. So I just wanna elevate that in particular that I heard today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cara. Um, next, George Fifield. Thank you, Mark. Um, I also want to thank everybody who spoke um, or sent in information. There was there was, was an amazing um, education um, on, on my part about about the feelings of about public art. And what I want to say is that this idea of public art, as opposed to non-public art, art in a gallery or art in a museum. Um, it's something I think about a lot because of what I do. I, I have a gallery, but I also do a lot of very prominently public um, uh, art projects um, around Boston and around New England. And so I'm always thinking about this difference. And um, even though uh, the sculpture has always um, disturbed me a little bit, I have to say that last week's meeting um, the, the thing that turned my um, attention to having it leave the space and go in to some private institution was Barry Gaither's description of it as a statue of white supremacy. And I don't see there being in public art uh, a, a, a reason to have that. Um, so I do think it should be removed from the space. I think it should be it is a sculpture, it should not be altered, it should not be destroyed, um, and it should be put into a space where it can be given context. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, Lisa Tong. Hi, everyone. Uh, first off, I wanna echo what every other commissioner has said that um, thank you everyone for sharing with us your responses and all of your experience. It has been really wonderful to hear and um, humbling. I just wanted to say that I want to remind people, this is a copy of the statue that is in Washington, DC. This statue was not paid for by the wages of newly freed enslaved people. This was paid by a white politician, a person of means. So I just want to be sure that I understand correctly and that others understand that. Um, Public art, while in the public, should reflect our, what the public is thinking and the contemporary tastes. And we, I think, on the commission have a duty to listen to what the Boston public, what the citizens, all colors of citizens in the Commonwealth are saying, but especially those who are being portrayed. And because of that, I feel very strongly that it should be removed. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Aqua Holmes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, as everyone else is saying, uh, the amount of folks that came out tonight to share their stories and their testimonies. Uh, we should do this more often, Boston. Um, we, we need to and we'd love to hear uh, what the city of Boston is thinking about and what they care about. Um, I, I think that public art for me is, is storytelling at the street level. And uh, as such, the imagery should strike the heart and engage the mind in an instant. Um, people are driving by, walking by, biking by. And so I, while I can appreciate you know, contextualizing something with plaques and, and banners and that sort of thing, there are things that happen in an instant with a work that's in the public space. With this piece, um, Emancipation, which was controversial from the very, very start, um, it's no different, but it's how it strikes the heart and mind that we've been talking about here tonight. And at last week's meeting, I think we were all just um, really in pain to hear about uh, a mother 
walking by with her son and his reaction, and as well, the testimony from, uh, I think it was Zachary this evening. So I, I can't imagine any other, any story of emancipation that could be uh, told in this way by having one person, whether they're, whether he's on his knees or rising from his knees, he's frozen in a space between, I mean, he's still got shackles on, so he's frozen in a space where he may be technically emancipated, but he has not yet become a full citizen. He is not yet equal. He is not standing tall in the fullness of, of emancipation. And I just can't imagine any other story that we would tell this way. I think the body language overwhelms um, any possible text that might accompany this piece. Um, as one speaker said, this is something else that I really care about, that Boston is an extension of the classroom. And that particular speaker said that he brings his students down and talks to them about the pieces. But there are many students that are just walking around and seeing things for themselves and struggling to interpret why a piece like that is there. Uh, I remember the first day that I saw the piece, I pulled my car over, I got out, and I looked around to see if anybody else was seeing what I was seeing because I had never seen the piece before. And it seemed like something that wouldn't be in the Boston landscape, something that was very much overwhelming emotionally as something that was a, a degradation of a black man. Um, I just, you know, what I heard today is that it hurts to look at this piece. And I feel like on the Boston landscape, we should not have works that bring shame to any group of people that are citizens, um, not just of Boston, but of the United States. If the newly emancipated uh, former slaves had been involved in the imagery of this piece, I imagine they would have chosen different imagery, more aspirational, more self-determining, more timeless, and perhaps even more provocative. Um, in my work as a children's book illustrator, you know, we struggle with these issues as well. And I look to the work of Rudine Sims Bishop and she suggests that we frame our work as authors and artists as windows, mirrors, or sliding glass doors. And I'll just explain that briefly. Uh, you can probably get the metaphor of a window, which allows you to see into another history or another uh, existence. Mirrors that reflect back to yourself, your own history and your own lifestyle and your own culture. And then sliding glass doors that are an invitation to join with others. So I'll just leave it there. I, I have thought about this in a lot of different ways, but I really feel like the best course of action would be to remove the piece. Uh, hopefully there'll be someone who would be happy to adopt it to provide the kind of educational response that can make this a teaching moment um, and to commission a new piece to take its place or to several new pieces to continue to tell the stories of all Bostonians. Thank you, Aqua. Uh, it's always hard to follow you because you give such a human touch to this question. Um, and I agree, I've been touched by many of the conversations um, that have been presented, the testimonials and the letters. Um, I did want to take a slightly different angle, which is that, you know, as a historian, we've, uh, myself, I'm a historian uh, and educator, I wanted to come at it with a historian's eye, and, and history has been brought up so many times in the conversation today and in many of the letters. Um, and I first want to begin by thanking um, several historians' voices who I ultimately disagree with, but who have presented very thoughtful positions here, as well as uh, a personal hero of mine, Byron Rushing, who is instrumental to my own uh, civil rights back in the marriage equality discussions. Uh, I admire him so much, and yet I disagree with him in this instance. Um, and also uh, Peter Gomes, uh, who wrote several years ago um, uh, a reflection on this piece. Um, so I dove into the archives. I read every single letter that was sent to us, um, and I um, spent a lot of time visiting the site uh, in the last years and tried to understand uh, its history. And I'm, you know, also we received a wonderful letter from the descendant of Moses Kimball, um, a testimonial today from uh, Archer Alexander's relatives. These things all weigh heavily on me as a historian because they're all asking for a history lesson to continue here. 
Um, and the same, I think, is true of most of the public commentary more generally, that people realize the importance of history in this, even if they determine that they want it removed. Um, they, almost everybody has mentioned not necessarily deaccessioning it entirely, but placing it in a different context where it can be interpreted. So I, uh, for me, history is a crucial, and I've seen it um, here. In fact, I think there's three histories which are really brought up around this project. Uh, or the statue. The first is the history of the statue itself, especially in the story of its origins and the role of Charlotte Scott and the freedmen and its funding. Um, this, I would say, is more the history of the statue in Washington, D.C., not the one in Boston. Um, and so I would distinguish those two things, that this is not exactly the marker of those people's aspirations. And there are also many other challenges uh, to the sense that we're listening to the voices of the freedmen. Um, in terms of their real involvement with the piece itself. So um, I, I find that history to be uh, still an open question for me. Um, the second history that's told of it is of emancipation itself. Um, this is a story of a moment in emancipation and the sculpture is trying to exhibit that history. Uh, personally, I find that it actually misrepresents rather than presents the moment of history for many of the uh, points that have been mentioned today, but I will quote uh, Barry Gator, who put in a letter to the commission and spoke to us last week, the narrative interpreted by the public statuary and art is often false, contradictory and one-sided, but we cannot let it be or remain false when it precludes the healing that our society desperately needs. Um, the third history is probably for me the most interesting one. Um, that is rooted in uh, a sense of living history um, that this sculpture uh, in its position allows for a public discourse to happen, the kind of discourse that we've been having um, this week. Uh, Byron Rushing wrote way back in 1992 about this, um, that statues like this tell us how black and white people were seen. Subsequent generations will better understand how their forebears saw and explained race and freedom. Uh, in my dive into the BAC archives, we found uh, letters from the early 1980s, letters from the mid 1980s, letters from the early 1990s, and letters from the mid 1990s, each time when this sculpture was debated as to whether it should be removed. Um, and so the statue has faced many of these same questions that we're facing today, it seems almost every five years. And I think that's part of the desire for a living history that the statue triggers uh, conversation uh, about, uh, as Byron Rushing put it, uh, freedom and race. Um, it seems to me, however, what, while these learning experiences, lessons of history are offered generously to all audiences who hear them, they come solely at the expense of one, uh, namely the black community, who must bear the burden of the demeaning depiction in the public sphere. And it's also, I think, a depiction that presents, in my mind, a false narrative. So the ultimate question I have faced is this, do the lessons offered by the statue outweigh the loss of dignity experienced by so many, so many members of the black community? For me at least, the answer is no. And then a second set of questions, furthermore, is this statue in this very setting the best way to communicate those lessons of history or to initiate conversations about race and freedom? Could the lessons be offered in a different manner by a less demeaning work of art, or even this artwork placed in another context where it can be better interpreted. Uh, and as somebody committed to public art, I believe the answer to these questions are a resounding yes. Uh, whether recommending to remove or keep the statue, uh, I'm inspired by how many of our letters, survey responses, testimonials, and our own internal report yearn for a greater learning experience to come from this statue. I would therefore like to propose uh, that uh, while I'm in support of removing it, uh, I'm also in support of doing more than just removing it. And I think that we've heard clear uh, direction from the public um, to pursue more than simply removal. So with that, I would like to open it up to a more general discussion. Uh, if there are issues that individual commissioners would like to bring up or thoughts, we can spend a few minutes on that. Um, and then I do have some ideas on potential motions um, that I'd like to bring up later, but I think we could begin with any more general comments after the reflections. Uh, 
Oh, I'd like to add a, a thought to this. Um, I think that this is such a, an important moment in the history of the city of Boston, the history of the Boston Art Commission, um, that whatever we do, I feel should be marked by an event. I don't feel that someone should drive by on Thursday and when they drive by on Friday, the sculpture's just gone and there's nothing to mark this event if that is the decision that the, the commission makes. I think that we have an opportunity to educate as we go through this process and um, we, should, we should seek to do that as well as you know, any of our other deliberations. I'd like to add that I agree with that. I think that's actually what I'm hearing regularly from the calls, whether it's to remove or to keep, and that there be more uh, framing of the, uh, the possibility of learning from this sculpture. So I would second that idea. I wasn't sure that we were voting tonight, so I'm a little surprised that, that we're um, heading in that direction. I understand the, the, the comments and the urgency to, to make a decision, but I think there's so, still some unknown um, parts of this discussion. And, and, you know, if we vote to remove the statue, do we know that as, when it would be removed, where it would go, um, sort of the, what the, what are the next steps to, to the piece? And I would be concerned about voting to remove it without knowing what the next steps are for for the piece. So that was one of the, the questions that I have. And then the second question I have is, what are we, and how do we think about replacing the, the piece? Is that um, something that needs to be discussed? Um, or what's the framework or the, the process to discuss it being replaced uh, on that site? Um, uh, so I think that's another question that I have that I don't think it's been answered in, in, in my mind. Um, what are we doing with the piece if it's and when it's removed? What's the next steps for replacing it? And then I was just curious on who owns the land that the piece is on? Um, what opportunities do we have as a commission or what could be put, placed on that? Um, and who is the owner? and what would be the process to engage um, the owner of that property? I'm assuming it could be the city, but I don't, I don't know. So those are some of the questions that I wrote down during the, during the discussion that we had earlier today, so. Michael, I'm wondering if maybe Karen or Kara could weigh in on some of those questions in particular. Sorry, I had trouble unmuting myself. Uh, I was starting to take notes. Um, so in terms of next steps, I would say there, there are probably a lot of things that we can't figure out until we understand the determination that the commission will be making. Um, we will have to do a lot of uh, logistical research um, if there is a vote to remove the piece. Um, in order to find out what an appropriate place would be. So I think there might be an order of operations um, concern, concern there. So we might need the vote in order to know how to research and to provide the information, uh, Michael, that you um, appropriately point out that we need. Um, my understanding is that it is city property. We're checking, we're double checking with assessing on that. Um, and we'll uh, pull back with you on that. Um, in terms of replacing the piece, we certainly have a process for commissioning projects that we could revisit and we could um, always open that up. We've had a really wonderful public process this far. I wonder if people wouldn't also be interested in talking to us about what that should look like. Uh, also okay. for, for me on, the, on some of the order of, of how to think about this, I think the educational component has been heard loud and clear and a lot of us have raised it again. And I think as long as we have a commitment to figuring out what that is, whether that's around the piece being recontextualized somewhere else, or making sure that we're documenting and telling this whole story and a lot of the history that we're hearing here somewhere where people can find it on the site or online or in other kinds of materials, 
I think as long as that commitment is there, we can make a decision about the removal of the piece without having the answers to what are we going to do with every, you know, exactly where is it going to go and when and what are we going to commission in its place. I think particularly um, what would be commissioned in its place should have its own process and its own public process that really informs that. But I would be comfortable um, with that commitment to the educational piece, considering the removal of the, of the artwork itself. Uh, Karen, I also wanted to add, were we able to, I mean, with the prospect of removal, we asked staff to start to look into whether it would be possible to hire a conservator and what kind of time frame we're talking about. Do we have any information on that or not yet? Um, we have an, I think, a financial estimate that would be about $15,000, I think, for removal um, and some idea of um, the cost of temporary storage before it could be placed. Um, but in terms of exact timeline, we would have to uh, look at scheduling, um, depending on the, the commission's um, preference there. And I, I will say we looked at the assessing website. Um, Sarah just sent me um, a screenshot of it, and it does say City Boston property. Thank you. Um, Michael, one other thought that I had, which is, you know, having, I think, Aqua, Lisa, George, and I uh, went through um, the only other uh, deaccessioning process that I know of in my experience on the commission of over eight years um, with Landwave, um, you know, we had a, we had a vote um, to uh, remove it from its site, not deaccession it, in fact. Um, uh, but then the details of how that happened and the time frame and the costs and uh, what that meant, um, as well as details such as the urgency to um, document properly um, anything that's removed from our collection. That's part of our policy statement on um, the removal of artworks from our collection. So we'd have to actually follow our guidelines. Uh, I don't think it could be, for instance, we couldn't remove this tomorrow if we voted tonight. It would be a process um, that would take some time so that the, the piece could be properly documented according to our guidelines. Um, and uh, obviously scheduling and other things would play into it. Does that answer some of your questions or? Yeah, I, I think it's important to make sure that people know what the expectations are of, of the vote and what the process would be for its removal um, so that people don't immediately think that the statue is going to be gone by the weekend. Um, that it does, even if the commission does vote tonight to uh, have it removed, that there is a, a, a framework and, and a time line for its removal. And that's what I want to make sure we're managing people's expectations about the, the whole process. Um, that. Um, the decision to, to remove the piece is um, not an easy one for us to make. I understand all the uh, comments that from all the parties, um, I would probably tend to vote to have it be removed, but I would wanna make sure that everyone understands there is a, a, a process that follows this vote for what happens to the statue, um, what gets, how it gets replaced or if it's replaced. Um, so I think that's the, the piece that I'm, uh, in, want to make sure that people understand that there is a, uh, it's not a, gonna be an immediate removal um, from its place. Yes, I, I think that's a great point. And I would add to it um, Aqua's point that I, in fact, even if we could remove it tomorrow, and do all our documentation. I don't think that's the right attitude for this. I've, I've gone down there several times um, recently and every time, and I know Aqua was there today and she heard, she saw the same thing. People were there to see the sculpture for themselves um, and to, you know, they've heard about the controversy in various ways um, and they wanted to actually witness it for themselves. And I think that that's, there's some value in allowing the public um, to learn more about the sculpture, even if we do decide that it should be removed. So I, for, for my belief, um, I mean, I'm still on the side of wanting to remove it, uh, but I agree with you that we need a process for its removal and 
um, you know, a, a certain length of time that allows it both to happen from a pragmatic perspective, but also that so that this can be a larger discussion uh, in the city of Boston. Yeah, and I think we have an opportunity to keep in touch with people to, you know, share our process with the city of Boston, either through our website or some of the ways that we got the information out about um, this meeting, uh, the last two meetings that we had. Uh, one of the young people from last week said she heard about it on Instagram. I mean, there's so many ways to keep people informed about what the process is. And I think we could we can manage that, whatever decision we make, uh, to keep the city of Boston updated on our processes. I was going to add that besides that, I think signage at the site um, about our decision would be very important. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, not necessarily a timeline, but this is this is what has been decided and this is, you know, you will, we will let you know more as it occurs. And if you have questions or responses, go and, um, and go to our site and, and weigh in. Agreed. So I think generally we're talking about a temporary signage for the moment before, and again, we're sort of talking as though we voted to take it down, but we haven't done that. <laughs> but if it were to come down, you'd want temporary signage there to begin with and then perhaps a permanent marker that it was there at some point. Is that correct, George? Well, no, actually, if, if we vote to keep it, I think we're going to need temporary signage yeah. and some permanent signage giving it more context. No matter what, we need to do what was talked no about what. in the 1980s, yeah. which is adding more, uh, more interpretation, no matter what. Sorry, was Camilo, were you about to say Agreed. something? Agreed. I mean, I think transparency through this process is, was also going to make it that much easier for everyone to understand exactly how the life of this sculpture has passed and what's going to happen to it in the future. I mean, let's be clear also, we're talking about removal, but we're not talking about deaccessioning from the collection. I think it would be a missed opportunity in order for us not to provide an educational you know, program for the past life and future life of this statue, wherever it may go. Yes. Okay. And maybe I'll just interpret that for the larger audience. I don't know if everybody knows our technical term, but deaccessioning is when we remove a piece entirely from our collection. Uh, we could either sell it or give it away or destroy it. Um, re removal, we might do something like a long-term loan to a museum or a library, as some, somebody mentioned, or place it in another setting uh, or put it in storage. All of those would be options with the removal, but deaccessioning would eliminate it from our collection. Um, so I don't, I haven't heard a lot of people talking about deaccessioning in this case. Uh, it seems like there's some value to this artifact um, uh, in the right setting. I think, did Lisa, did you have another comment or I thought I heard somebody else raise a question. So, uh, any other comments from other commissioners? I was going to suggest, is it any way that we can think about postponing the vote into our regular scheduled meeting in, in a couple weeks and have at least by then develop some sort of a framework that begins to lay out what the process would be in terms of the vote one way or the other, if it is voted to remove where we would begin to determine where it could go, what the cost would be to removal, where would, if there's a temporary storage for it. I, I just think that I understand that we're not going to have um, definitive answers for all these questions, but it would be at least to have some sort of, again, process framework or something that begins to outline the, the, process, the procedures that we would need to go through if that was the direction we were headed. Because um, I just don't feel comfortable at this point to vote one way or the other on the piece without knowing more about the, the questions that I've been, been raising. Yeah, I, it seems like some of the questions are going to take a little while, um, depending on what the outcome of a vote might be. I'm not even sure if by our next meeting we would have details on that. So I'm not sure if postponing it will change the outcome. I'm not necessarily suggesting details, but at least a broad outline of what needs, what are, what are the things that need to be done in order to uh, achieve 
say either removing it or staying and having interpretive uh, elements added to the, the piece or its grounds. Others want to weigh in on that? I'm comfortable with um, with having a vote today if the motion is is worded in the right way um, that we can um, we can kind of settle the fact that we uh, may or may not want to remove this piece and then work out the particulars and how we're going to remove it or keep it. So um, uh, I, I have a motion in front of me. I don't know if you wanted to take motions yet, Mark and, and Equa, um, but. I'd be happy to read it. Mark, you're familiar with it. Okay. Uh, I'd just come on and say I'd agree with Bob. Uh, why don't we hear from everybody on this discussion topic? Yeah, I, I'm comfortable with taking a vote today, understanding that um, a lot of details will be to come. Um, but the vote is about our intention and um, you know, we even when we vote on a piece of public art, we don't necessarily know exactly how it's going to go into the ground and, you know, all of that. So I'm comfortable with taking a vote today. I am too. Agreed. I feel like what people have said, many of the commissioners are leaning towards either removal or relocating. So it feels like we have to find those answers anyway. And we always have lots of provisions in our motions. Uh, did we miss anyone? Cara, do you want to say anything? I'm good with taking a vote today. Okay. George? Yeah. Yes, I'm definitely good with taking a vote today. And did Same I miss here. Camilo? Okay. Same here. All right. So um, if we're looking at a motion, and I would like to... Right. Can, I, can I ask that we pull up the, the Google document as we we're using uh, it before so that people in attendance can see um, the language as we draft it. Okay. Whoever is sharing their screen. Bob, would you like to begin a, a motion? And I, I just wanted to preface by saying that um, I think this could be a, a wordsmithing exercise too. Um, right. because I, I do think that there's a lot of importance to what it is that we vote on. Um, and I, for one, would like to encourage us to vote on more than just removal, to actually think about some of the larger questions, if that's um, amenable. And it, it could be that we have multiple motions that we vote on, or it could be that it's one uh, com complex motion. Right. So, Bob, do you want to start us off with some initial thoughts? Let me try this one. Uh, engage an art conservator the first document and then remove the bronze statue of the emancipation group and place it in storage. Removal should be marked by a public event. Documentation should be entered into the city archive and should include photography of the statue and setu as well as drawings and or a three-dimensional scan. That might get us started. Okay. So if you guys can see what I just typed, I think I missed a little bit. Um, engage an art conservator, Bob, do you mind restating that? Uh, yeah, engage an art conservator to first document and then remove the bronze statue of the emancipation, emancipation group and place it in storage. Removal should be marked by a public event. Documentation should be entered into the city archive and should include photography of the statue in Setu as well as drawing and or a three-dimensional scan. Not perfect, but it, it might be nice to bullet the public event at, and the, yeah, as a separate bullet list. But don't we need to start first that, um, we move to, we, we're making a motion to remove the artwork pending that X, Y, and Z happen. I, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, oh, how would you? Because, because normally we say, you know, um, you have to have an action before we can say all in favor. So you have to say something like, um, I move that we remove the emancipation group provided that we do these following steps. 
We got you. Right? That's better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We all make up one super commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> It's true, though. I love what Aqua and Mark both said, because you guys both encapsulated what I very quickly tried to say, but didn't say as beautifully or eloquently as the two of you together. So mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> um, do, you do we think that the um, informational, uh, the contextualization should be a part of this motion? that that is one of the things that we are committing to do in addition to potentially moving the piece and relocating it like the educational piece yes i mean i think the clamor and furor and vigor besides the removal of the piece from the public was also for the need for history to be respected and understood and this sculpture is a receptacle of it even though it is a copy and i'm also wondering what the original will now be uh, which which part not within not within our purview, but I think it's incredibly it would be a missed opportunity to put this just in storage. So and maybe uh, we could specify something temporarily in storage uh, while we uh, find the new hold for public, it. A, a, a strategy for what to do with it. I don't know how to frame that, but I think finding a new home for it is very important. I agree. Casting a wide net mm -hmm. uh, and maybe bringing in some some other people to make suggestions. So could we add a um, another part to this motion, which is forming uh, or initiating a process to determine what to do with the statue in the future? And that we might want public involvement in that process. Yeah, and in, in maybe say including uh, finding a new home for it, uh, reciting it on city property, which probably is is not what we want to do, but just to be a little bit more specific about what that determined what to do with the sculpture, uh, with the statue, give some what ifs. We could just say reciting it, not even specify. Yeah. Yeah, I think we should not put in anything that would tie our hands that would allow us to move on to doing other things. Gotcha. For example, if you wanted to put out a call for a replacement sculpture that we should be, still be able to do that even if it's in temporary storage mm -hmm. to give us options mm -hmm. yes i think that's a separate part of it too which is i would like us to um create a call for artists for a new artwork at the site i'd like us to commit to replacing yes. mm -hmm. would and it be have, possible to even ask from the public what potentially could happen for the recontextualization of the sculpture. So there's two parts to this. One is, and I agree with you, in both parts, the public could be involved. One is the recontextualization of the existing statue, mm -hmm. and the other is a new work of art that could be at the, placed at the site. Right, and, and thematically, that new work of art, what, what might the public think it should be about? Is it about emancipation? Is it about Alexander? Is it about Lincoln? Um, I'd love to hear some thoughts on that. I believe the, 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 the Museum of Natural History in New York took a sculpture and completely created a new website for it that was glorious in you know, explaining the history of that said statue. Was that the Roosevelt? I think so, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you push that up just a little bit? Um, Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, a few things to suggest when we engage an art conservator to first document, then they should uh, recommend how it's removed. Mm -hmm. And then they should also be engaged to supervise its removal mm -hmm. and placement into its uh, storage. I think it's important to have them engaged throughout the whole process. Mm -hmm. We say temporary storage here or just storage? Oh, temporary, well, whatever. I like temporary because it, I mean, we could yeah. define how long temporary is, but I think, you know, we really heard clearly that we should do something with the sculpture, not yeah. leave it in a box for 20 years. Okay. I agree. Um, you had specified first, Bob, bronze statue. Um, 
the removal. So I think there was an implication there that we're only talking about the statue and not the the granite here. Correct. In your original movement. Correct. Draft motion. How the bronze statue. Yes. Thank you. I think that pedestal has a lot of possibilities in in this work that we're trying to do with this piece. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of blank space on it. Uh, and also it's the location is just, it's, it's a beautiful space. You know, when I went down there today, um, it's a beautiful space to communicate uh, with the city. And so I, I love the, leaving the pedestal there as a possibility. I agree. I think we should keep that in play, at least until we have more information, including input from the public on what we want to commission for that location. Mm -hmm. okay. I've mentioned this to other commissioners before, but there's a wonderful um, British project called the Fourth Plinth. Yes. Uh, Square, where there is a, a, a plinth that never had a statue. And they just basically gave it a rotating um, commission to different artists to do something on top of it. One person just climbed up and lived there. <laughs> Well, with, uh, you know, rental costs in Boston, that might be a great possibility for artists here. <laughs> um, there's a couple other, I mean, we, we're starting to get a good long list here. So um, I wanted to add that I think signage should be, did we, did we include that in here? That signage should be added to the site while it's there, but I'd also think we'd have a permanent marker stating that this was the site of the Emancipation Group and talk about its both its history and its controversy. So temporarily and so temporarily we, you talked about like immediately after this decision. Yeah, it's, or as quickly as possible after this decision so the public knows what's happening. I think George mentioned that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once removal actually happens, I think we should install a permanent sign that marks the history of that place. Do we need to talk about um, budget or, you know, where funds might come from for a new piece of art? Do we need to be specific about that or just leave it open as a call for artists for new artwork? I think we keep that in mind as we do the RFP because I don't know if we should be tying uh, the motion to the funding, but mm -hmm. that's just my feeling. I don't know. Well, we did say we could have more than one motion too, so maybe it doesn't okay. go here and goes uh, in another okay. motion. Phase two. Yeah, because <laughs> I mean, we definitely want to make sure we can we can pay for yes uh, if this is the direction. Yeah. Is there funding in place to do removal and temporary storage to do some of the things we're asking for? For uh, temporary for the removal and temporary storage. Um, my understanding, our, our assessment was that it's $15,000 for removal and it'll be, I think, three to $400 per month for temporary storage. Um, and I think we can manage to locate those funds. Um, I think in terms of any other funding, I think that'll be a, you know, a worthwhile, but a, um, a bigger discussion of exactly where they would come from. Okay, does that uh, money include the conservator to help? Yeah, we got that from a conservator. You got that. Okay. And they could be engaged throughout the whole process? Right. I think we'd want to be very specific about some of the um, aspects of the motion, about the drawings, um, the 3D scan, photographs. I think, you know, there's, it's possible that some of that would have to be subbed out, but I'm sure we can figure it out. Um, Karen, is there a way, I think in this motion, we could probably just pick off all the things that we know we can do with the 15,000 plus the three to 400 for storage. So maybe that's phase one. And then the second phase is um, either not depending on those funds or locating future funds for the public, um, consulting the public to figure out what the new RFP, to figure out whether or not we should use the existing plinth, you know, for the new artwork, et cetera. Oh. 
You'd have two motions? Yeah, so it keeps moving along. One thing we know we can do, the other thing right. we have to look for funding. Right. It would be everything through the signage then would be part one. And then the call for artists and the funding for new artwork would be a second. Yeah. And now I don't know if this is appropriate, but there are two uh, pieces that honor black heroes that are in the pipeline right now. For this phase two that involves funding and things like that, is it possible that we might also, because part of the solution, as someone said, is that there's, there's not enough on the landscape. So here are two pieces that are in the pipeline but need more funding. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to tie some of that to this larger or make this a larger um, motion that involves maybe helping to fund those projects as well? I, I could even add to that that maybe we should be thinking about a, um, working with the city, collaborating with the city to um, look at various ways that we can uh, overcome the short um, the shortcomings of our of our uh, current collection. So it might be even a broader statement. Mm -hmm. um, think about whether the city could set up some processes or funds for that type of work. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you want for there to be as many monuments up by black artists or about uh, the black history, what have you. So I don't think we should try to be too specific to tie our hands. I think maybe, you know, keeping in mind that we should, of course, work with the city of Boston to, to either collaborate or help identify funding for these other additional projects. Mm -hmm. But I would not want to tie this to that. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little hesitant about putting um, the future position of the statue into a phase two. I know that it's not something we can decide quickly, but to me, it's actually an instrumental part of the decision about removing the sculpture is to find it a new home. So I think that we should keep that. It's not, a, it's not another topic. I I, okay. Yeah, I, I agree. Wait, can you, I don't understand. What he, are you saying, had me move, he had me move one of the bullet points I had put under phase two back to phase one about figuring out where to put the statue. What happens if you can't, I'm going to play devil's advocate. What happens if we can't find a home well, this doesn't, for the statue for, in a long give, time? This doesn't give us a timeline. It doesn't okay. demand anything particular. I mean, we could not follow through on this. Um, I think that would be a shame, but I, I feel like it's an interconnected question. I've heard so from so many people in the public that this should be removed and placed somewhere else where it can be better interpreted. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it should be part of that. I think it should be part of the, the thing, not to say that it's in another phase and we'll address it later. I mean, we have to address it later. We can't figure that out tonight, but I think we should be committed to doing that uh, as part of our first phase motion. Mark, I would agree, because I worry that the money will run out or at some point someone's going to be concerned about spending $400 a month on storage, if it lasts a year or longer or whatever, that, that money begins to add up. So, you know, I think the intentions are there to, to, to sort of store temporarily until we find what happens with it. But I also know the realities of city budgets and money and how things can, especially in the period now where we're dealing with the COVID and the sort of outcomes. Um, I see what it's doing to our agency's budget. I see what it's doing to the city's budget. Mm -hmm. So I worry about how long we're going to be able to temporarily store this piece um, without right. saying we can't afford this anymore. So we have to do something. So I agree. There, I think there's. Uh, some urgency to finding it. I understand we may not find it quickly, but I think it should be in the phase one to two. Um, I would not be surprised if we get a lot of suggestions after this meeting. Yes. Mm -hmm. So do we have a first motion? I think we're pretty close. Um, 
Do we need to refine the wording here or we can do that? Um, do we want to say anything more about the public event? That seems like a very short bullet there. Yeah. Uh, um, a public yeah. event. Or hold or uh, create a public event that will, um, I don't want to say celebrate, but it's, you know, that will commemorate or acknowledge. Knowledge, yep. Yes. And educate at, at the same time. Uh, yeah, acknowledge, yes, yes. yes. definitely. Form. Yeah, and form is better. Yeah. And then educate. Acknowledge, inform, and educate. Okay, how's that? We'll do them all. <laughs> Mark, an Oxford comment. <laughs> and that public it. event might need to be virtual yeah yeah sure. i mean but i know we, we want to yeah. have a way to do like maybe there's a way that we can engage people or sure. give them material so that they can go visit the site kind of between now and whenever this is but i just want to flag that that we yeah. might not be able to have a gathering at the actual location but we don't have to specify it's just a public event of some kind yeah I think we have to acknowledge the sculpture's history and inform the public uh, about, I mean, we can't acknowledge the public. I mean, we could, but that's not what we're trying to do. I acknowledge you, Mark. <laughs> Mark, what are you saying, inform what? <laughs> I just, I'd say, and inform the public, acknowledge the statue's history and inform the public about it. Oh, this is bad grammar, but. Inform the public, yeah. period. And inform the public, yeah, thank you. And period. Less is more. So if you wanted to store this for a year at $400, it would be um, $4,800. So it's roughly $20,000 to do this in, and have a year's worth of storage, FYI. Yeah, so the, the way that the, this will most likely get paid is from the Public Art Revolving Fund. And I will say, like, we've been having discussions for a long, long time about how that's not actually a sustainable source of funding for care and maintenance of the public art collection. So I think we'll be very motivated to not be paying that, but it also raises a larger question. I think, you know, as we're talking about in phase, like phase two or phase three of this, which is what are the other funding issues that we have around being responsive to something like this and to really being able to commission things and, yeah. and be more nimble. Um, yeah. This is one of the issues, right? But we can, we can absolutely handle that for the time being. It's yeah. Great. a more big, big picture question. Karen, yeah, it's small, a small edit here. I vote that we remove the bronze statue known as the Emancipation Group. Mm. I think it's, it's important that it be about the bronze statue, not about the whole thing. And the first um, sentence. You have, it, you have it later on? In the first bullet. Yeah. The bronze figurative elements of the Emancipation Group. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Great. Camilla, are you in the arts? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, just provide work here, or I don't know how we want to. Hmm. The, there's not really a match between the beginning of the motion and the. Yeah, we'd have to say like engagement. Engagement, yeah. An art conservator. Engagement of. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then it would be commission detailed documentation of the artwork into City Archive. Yeah. And then commissioning of detailed document. It'd have to be commissioning of. Yeah. Um, missioning creation of how do you get that? I think it's actually commissioning of because we're sort of pending of an event. No, no, he's talking about the first one. Uh, commissioning of detailed documentation because it's all based on pending. And I'm assuming this documentation would include this process, all the testimony, the discussion, 
We're, we're recording these. Um, the first one we had is already on the website. If anyone out there is interested, it's, it's a lot like this with a lot of moving testimony, but a more fumbling on the administrative side. Um, and all this will be submitted, in the, to be submitted into the archives as well. Can I ask, what do you mean by archives? So we have our own records, but you're talking about the department, the city's archives, because we, the Art Commission, we keep our own records as well. Well, that could be fine. Into city archives. I'm not sure if you meant city archive or the commission's archives. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think it just needs to be publicly accessible and permanent. So that would be where that is, I don't know. Well, that would be good to add though, publicly accessible, because I don't see that. My point was that I think there should be the narrative that should be part of, in addition to the photographs, the drawings, the 3D scan, um, and the history of the piece as well. Um, and I think, as I was saying, that the process that we took in order to make this decision. Yeah, and that will include a lot of letters, the survey. Um, we have a lot of materials that we can add into that. Mm -hmm. um, in the next one, creation of a public event for the removal. I don't know, is that what we're sort of thinking? Well, you know, ceremony. I, I was thinking about that, like the day that it sort of goes up on the crane sort of thing. Um, but I'm also thinking yeah. about some cities that have invited artists to interact with pieces like this um, that could be a, a, a teaching, educating, informing moment with a public artist as possibly a public event. Um, I don't know, do we need to be specific about what the public event will be right no. now? No, I think we can figure it out. No, yeah, no details. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think if, if you're saying you want some sort of ceremony around removal, that's something that we potentially would have to plan immediately. So just to understand that that would be good on the logistics side for, for us. Maybe it's not around the removal. Maybe it's around, okay. or, you know, maybe the future If it's future more open, thing. that's okay. Yeah, I think we leave it more open because we could decide okay. you take it away and you leave the plinth and the plinth, which is the symbol of what was there, is then the educative moment that we have, you know, some event or when the new thing comes and then you bring the celebration of the new thing with the previous thing. Right. Yeah, I think we should. You wanted to inform the public or to engage them or invite the public? Engage, inform, all of that. I think it's fine. Yeah. No. Okay. I'll, I'll say the question is whether or not they'll be participating the way it, it's reading to me right now. Mm. I think though I we, think it's fine. Yeah, I think we could leave that open too. The next bullet seems like it's actually part of the last bullet, which is recontextualization of ex I was going to say the same thing. Yes. So, initiate a process to determine how to recontextualize the existing statue. And it's in your last one though already. Oh, it's, it's there. Initiate a process to determine how to recontextualize. The and that could be a, a public call as well. Mm. That's interesting. Um, and that's different from the signage. I mean, it could be the same, but. But but somehow you've gotten rid of finding a new home for it that was in the last bullet before. Well, that's what the recontextualization is, but I think you're right, it should be explicit. Yeah. I, so as the existing statue in a new home, in a new setting, Yeah. in a new public setting. Mm. Uh, if it's in a museum, does that count as public? No, it's, it shouldn't be I a public. Right. It should be, it should be a museum. I, mean, I don't regard a museum as a public setting. No, not if you have to pay a fee. What about a library? The final bullet went on to the next page, if you look. Um, oh. oh, OK. Yeah. Oh. oh. Sorry. 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 
Well, I like the new one. Yeah, let's delete the old one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wait, which one do you mean? The initiator like the one. product, the last initiator this product. One? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I think we have to work on the last one. It's basically add signage. Uh, I just want to go back to the one before. I think we should say in a new publicly accessible setting. Yeah. That will rule out museums, though, won't it? No. I think it's arguable. Yeah, they're not pub public, but they're publicly accessible. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, pending addition of signage to add it, addition of signage to site. What was your firm? Addition of signage. <clears throat> Does that work, addition? Yeah, because it's all pending. Pending is the root. Okay. Pending addition of signage to, to the site. Uh, it to, to interpret the piece. To interpret the piece before its removal. To, um, signage to the site, sorry, keep to the site. Um, addition of signage to the site uh, to interpret the statue prior to its removal. And the, is this going to include historical information? I think we can decide that later, but I think uh, yeah, or at least it would guide people to a place where they could find it. Mm. Um, uh, and permanent uh, uh, signage to mark. I don't yeah. know. To we just say that. permanent signage after the removal. Yeah. I think a lot of this we're going to have to figure out. Yeah. I agree with the general statement that I feel like a bunch of people have said at this point of communicating both the process and the interpretation of the piece or making that kind of the same information. So I, I feel like it's fine the way it is. I don't think we need to detail it more in that bullet point. Okay. And uh, Karen, we're getting a, I got a little message from somebody, um, initiation of a process to determine how to recontextualize so that they're all mm -hmm. in the same grammatical. Um, I think in the first bullet point, we could probably get rid of the word first to document, recommend how the bronze statue is removed, supervise its removal and replacement and, and placement into storage. I think this looks good. Should they be periods or semicolons? <laughs> Semicolons, and then you could have a colon after pending. <laughs> as long as you're consistent, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Have a colon where after pending. Uh, do we have one more after this? The signage one is missing here on the next page. That's so that. Yeah, I can see them. I have I have it in print view. I don't know whose screen is being shared, but if you change the setting, then people can see them together. I can actually, you know what? Just let me oh, just let me move it down. Let me just um, move this down. We can see it now. Yeah. Can we look at phase two? Is this something that we would want to wait until our next meeting to? discuss phase two? I think so. I would be okay with that. <laughs> I would be okay with that too. Yeah. Yes. So uh, move us to the July 14 meeting? Yeah. The phase two piece, yeah. Um, I think we could also change the language in the opening. I move that we, uh, I think it should become the Boston Art Commission moves or make the motion that we, so we don't have move, remove. <laughs> We're all getting tired now. I know. 
Um, well, we're gonna we're gonna have to attribute it to somebody. Yeah, somebody has got to say the minutes. We oh, we need okay. minutes. Okay. You could someone can that the art commission removes. So I propose. Yeah. And the funding part is in phase two, right? Yeah. That's how we have it right now to be discussed at um, our July 14 meeting. I would recommend that we follow up on this. Um, it doesn't have to be tonight, but um, this week that we have something that we can share with the public on the website that also talks about our intention for this next July meeting to talk about what commissioning a new work and how that's supported looks like so that it's clear that even though we're not voting on that right now, that we have an intention around that as part of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, something I have to put on the website. Lost my permission. Yeah, and maybe we don't call them phase one and two, we just call them motion one and motion two. Motion two will come later. So the question I have, do they need to, do all these steps need to be determined before the piece gets removed or um, just that's the, so again, it's the expectations of the public on when the piece will be removed. Um, so I, I just, I'm curious. Maybe it's something we discussed. I just want to know what the if there's a sequence. That all of this would have to happen before, except for the signage that comes after. All of this would. I mean, initiating a process is not figuring out everything about the artwork, but we're initiating that process. I think we should. Right. We but should. but once you guys vote this, we can start working on it. Right. So we we need we need this vote so that we can initiate the process in terms of. Moving, moving things forward. Um, but all I'm just answering to Michael's point, I think all of these are contingent upon happening before the sculpture, before the statue is taken down, except for putting permanent signage up after its removal. Yeah, I think a lot of it, my comment is managing the expectations of the, the public. Meaning that this might take several yeah. weeks for this to happen. We could also make that clear in our follow-up communications. We could we could say that this isn't, you know, that there are these steps that may take weeks to determine. I, I don't know that people are expecting that this is gonna be an instant process, but I think knowing what the intention is, is, is the important thing. Um, Cause there are a lot of moving parts, a lot of pieces. It's hard to remake history. I mean, that statue has been there for how long? Oh, over 100 <laughs> years. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and this is an old city full of old things. I'm only bringing this up because uh, it, I'm a little worried that what we've seen happen to other statues throughout so the much. country. Um, afraid it'll get torn down? Yes, that's one of my fears uh -huh. that if people don't know or understand that what we're doing here, that someone may want to take it down immediately, thinking that we're moving too slow or too deliberative or, or whatever. So that's why I'm... Well, I think that temporary signage might be very important to move forward quickly on then. Mm -hmm. um, and I think on that, we can add that the, you know, there's more information that will be coming up down in the near future pending, you know, scheduling. And we can work on the language. And I think it's a communications question for us as well to make sure that people can see these videos and hear some of the process um, mm -hmm. and some of the intentionality. So we have to think a little bit about how we do that, but I think it's possible. Okay, so for, from what I'm hearing, we have a motion on the floor. Um, I guess, uh, Bob, do you want to formalize that? Um, and then we would move to a vote if we got a second. Bob, are you on?
Did we lose Bob? Bob so is I'm, muted. Sorry. I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, I don't know if we if we have to read the entire motion or this motion um, uh, is in front of us and we can just vote on the motion. What uh, what is the procedure? I mean, I think for accessibility, it's it's nice to to read it aloud and also for the audio file. Okay, let me let me begin. I propose that the Boston Art Commission remove the bronze figurative element of the Emancipation Group pending engagement of an art con uh, conservator to document, recommend how the bronze statue is removed, supervise its removal and placement into temporary storage. Commissioning of detailed documentation of the artwork into Bach archives, which may include photography of the statue in situ, drawings and a 3D scan as well as the history of the piece and the process that we took in order to make this decision. Creation of a public event that will acknowledge the statue's history and inform the public. Initiation of a process to determine how to recontextualize the existing statue in a new publicly accessible setting and additional to temporary signage to the site to interpret the statues prior to its removal and permanent signage after the removal. Could I just add one small thing, which is where we, you have the word we, we might say BAC. Okay. Wait, where's we? Um, it's in the second bullet point at the end, uh, towards the end that, uh, in, yeah. the, in the process that the BAC. Okay, got it. Okay. Thank you, Bob. That was an excellent yeah. motion. I'm glad. How did you think that all up on your own? I don't know how I thought that up, Mark. <laughs> uh, so I hear a motion. Do I hear a second? A second. Okay, and then uh, we will go through a roll call with a vote of uh, yay or nay. So I don't have the list here in alphabetical order, but um, Bob, since you were the motioner, what's your uh, yes. Okay. Yay. Camilo? Yay. Michael? Yes. Kara? Yes. Uh, George? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Aqua? Yes. And myself, uh, a resounding yes. So the motion passes. Um, and I believe our next order, I, I feel like we should be in a room and people should be excited about this, but um, <laughs> I think we will move on to our adjournment. Um, there's a few things for those of you who've watched Paint Dry and uh, enjoyed us uh, with this long process of coming up with a motion. Uh, we wanna thank you, um, encourage you to continue the conversation with us. This is the beginning of more conversations around this piece and perhaps other pieces as well. Um, here's some information where you can find additional resources on the processes that we're undergoing uh, and stay in touch with us. So thank you all for being a part of this conversation. With that, I wonder if there's a motion to adjourn. I will put forth a motion to adjourn this meeting um, joyfully. I'll second that. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, that seems like enough eyes. And uh, thank you again to Boston for coming out to work with us on this. We're so, so um, proud of our city right now, and we look forward to the future. Well said, well said. Well said. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.